I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day, we were snowed in, and when you're snowed up in there, you're stuck, basically. Now, there are plenty of bears and deer up there. We kept salt licks, corn, and all kinds of stuff around. Not to hunt, but just to feed them. Well, I walk by the back window, which is over the underground garage, where we kept the snowmobiles and four-wheelers. I see this big brownish thing in the woods, probably 50 feet from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. I was shocked because I had never really seen a bear there, but heard the stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mom to show her, and as we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up. And I don't mean like a bear. I mean like a big, tall man standing up. It then turned around and walked with a huge stride and basically took off into the woods. We stood there shocked. What the hell was that? And my uncle just says, oh, that's a Squatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with a comedic remark, but after that, I never went to those woods alone again. There. That's my encounter. The woods by where my father grew up have an old abandoned house, or well, house is, I should say, scattered throughout the woods. I'm from the Hudson Valley. Anyone from that area knows the woods there have old houses, or at least the foundations remaining. Anyway, when my father was younger, he and everyone else basically would climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had an old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up to smoke and hang out, so a lot of the things were just smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, blanking on proper term, just a flat rock surface that you had to scale. This was also his usual way down. So one night, he went up alone and was working his way down. Night was settling in and as he was lowering himself down, the drop off he felt had an odd presence and glanced upwards towards where he was just standing. Basically what he saw was a quick glance because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as basically very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. It wasn't a bear, at least from the glance he got. Normally, you'd take things to your parents and tell you you have some doubt, but after a recent trip to his mother's and her sharing some of his stories that he told, it just made it more believable. There's also that whole you'll see what you want to see, so who knows. I'm terrified of heavily wooded areas, to be honest. I was on a four-day canoeing trip with friends in a remote part of the southeast United States back when I was a young teen. We were up late, built a bonfire, and goofed off as young boys do. I'm sure we were making a lot of noise. Eventually the fire died down to just coals and we just sat around it talking when we heard a distant high-pitched scream. It freaked us out for a little bit, but eventually we forgot about it and went back to talking. A while later, one of my friends pointed to the opposite bank of the river and says, Guys, what is that? We looked, and standing there in the trees was a huge silhouette of some figure watching us. It was faint, but it was illuminated by the full moon, and it was huge. We just kind of stared at it in shock for a moment before backing away. We went to get our friend's dad and some flashlights. He was intent on showing us that nothing was there. We got back to the spot and it was still there, so we shined our flashlights on it, but it wasn't enough to get a better look. But the thing's eyes shone red with the reflection of our flashlights. We watched it watching us for a bit, and it walked up along an embankment, and then walked back and disappeared into the woods. That was more than a decade ago, and we rarely talk about it. We were all pretty freaked out. Finally, a chance for me to tell my story. About 10 years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut down our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandfather in the front seat, and my mom and sister in the back seat. I was in the bed of the truck, along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road, 
and all of a sudden, my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it is maybe a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall, dark figure walking parallel to the road just about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see Bigfoot, he just laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look at it, the figure had changed directions and was walking away from the road. The last thing I saw was the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have an explanation for what I saw, and every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell everyone my story just so he could laugh. Didn't see anything, but heard. I lived in rural Massachusetts to anyone who's familiar that means miles of woodland with spaced out suburban areas in between. I was walking down my grandfather's logging trail, getting ready for his funeral. I'm also an avid mushroom collector, so I'm always walking slowly and staring at the ground. Friends hate me, basically. So I get to this cool little white-capped mushroom and stop to take a close-up picture of it. And that's when I heard it. The best way I can describe it is as if somebody with a lot of flesh on his knuckles were punching a tree. Now, I know what a deer sounds like when they stomp to protect their children and are smashing their antlers on trees. I've heard bear, fisher cat, moose, pretty much any animal in the western Massachusetts that exists. So, naturally, I looked up and freaked the hell out. It was so rhythmic. Thud. 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 It went on for minutes at the same pace. So, being the curious person that I am, I let out a whistle that couldn't be mistaken for a bird. Right after my whistle, I hear a low, quick whistle back. My first thought is, oh, it must be some asshole logger scooping the land past the no trespassing gate. Ignorant, I know. So I yell out, hello? Pretty much as loudly as I could. Then, whatever it was, ran away faster than I've ever heard a human being run. And using my experience with deer, dogs, moose, and bear, I just assessed that I couldn't possibly rationalize it being a four-legged creature. I know that what they sound like running, and this was much closer to a two-legged creature. I'm 100% positive on that. What doesn't make sense, however, is that the two-legged creature that went, ran away from me, faster than any two-legged creature I have ever heard before, also sounded like it was at a minimum of 250 pounds. The steps were loud and very frantic. A lot of people believe Bigfoot has a spiritual connection to the forest it remains in, and thus the creatures in it as well. I do not find it a coincidence that this happened the day of my grandfather's funeral. I ran all the way home and I have never looked back. Okay, so I have a story that happened to me and my friends. To set the scene, we were on a Boy Scout camping shooting trip. There were 20 to 30 of us. We were in a little cabin thing with windows on the front and back and a front and back door. There were wooden tables all around the area. The adult cabin was about an eighth of a mile down a gravel road in the dark. There was obviously a buddy system because it's Boy Scouts. So it's around midnight and everyone had been telling scary stories, just like a normal camping trip. Well, I had to go to the bathroom and asked my friend to come along. He said sure, and he got our knives. We knew that they were bears in the woods and it made us feel safer. Well, we went to the bathroom and began our walk back. This is where it got scary. I felt an instinctual fear. I looked to my friend and he had the same look as me. We began to walk just a little bit faster and unfold our pocket knives. I then turn around and see it. It looked similar to a cat, but it was roughly six feet tall and was on its hind legs and, and was on its hind legs, kind of hunched over. I freaked the hell out and started running. My friend sees it too, and we sprint back to the cabin. It began making a moaning, howling noise and followed us very closely. We pound on the door, and the guys let us in. We tell them what we saw, and they actually believed us. So we lock the front door and look at the back door. It had no lock. We pushed a table up against it and had a kid there with his knife for safety. 
We draw the blinds on all the windows that had them. One of them didn't, and we sat there with all the lights on. Then we see the eyes outside of the windows without blinds. We are all shitting ourselves, and the thing slowly walked to the back door. We heard it bumping up against it, maybe trying to open it, we think. It then left, but we still thought we were going to die. No one slept that night. And when the adults came to wake us up, we told them, and they just laughed and said we were making it up. We know it happened, even if they didn't believe us. Not me, but my cousin. In the 80s, my cousin was on a camping trip with his wife. It wasn't a busy day for camping, and according to my cousin, the ranger told them that they were the only ones camping there that night. Anyway, so it's getting late, and my cousin said he spots something across the lake. He thought it was a bear standing, so he grabs his binoculars. It was sort of like a bear, but it was standing up on its hind legs. He said it wasn't a bear because it had a face, like a 70-year-old man, and the fur was longer than a bear. He thought maybe it was someone in a suit, but it disappeared quickly, whatever it was. He was so spooked and wanted to leave the park immediately. His wife thought he was being ridiculous, though, and just having an overactive imagination. She had brought a shotgun and insisted that they be fine if anything happened. Anyway, so that night everything is going fine until my cousin is awakened by footsteps. Now, his wife is still asleep at this point, but he doesn't want to wake her. He just tries to keep as still and quiet as possible. A figure approaches the tent. My cousin said he was positioned so that his head was on the corner of the tent. This figure leans down and gently presses its hand around the corner of the tent. So the figure is basically putting its hands around my cousin's head. I don't remember how long he said this lasted, but this figure eventually left. My cousin said it smelled like mechanical things, like someone working on a car, although he heard no car. They, next morning, everything at the campsite was untouched. No problems at all. My cousin didn't mention anything about finding footprints. There wasn't any evidence that someone had been there. He eventually went and researched the area and discovered that their camping area is supposedly a hot spot for Bigfoots and such. He firmly believes that he saw some kind of Sasquatch. I'm not sure if I believe him. If anything, I always thought it was just a person messing with him. I actually have several other stories, but I didn't want a post to drag on, and I thought it would be too overwhelming. What convinced me was I saw it happened, and my cousin saw it with me. We were cruising through some rural areas in my cousin's car, and I want to say it was about 1 or 2 a.m. We weren't smoking or drinking, but just having a nice cruise. We went on this road that went through some heavy woods, but we did it before, so we had no fear. It was dark, of course, no moon, with just a slight sprinkle of rain. We were coming to this part in the woods where there was a street light, but it was an old light and was starting to dim out. There used to be an old building there, but was torn down, but the light stayed up for a few years. Mind you, this was very rural, and no one lived nearby for maybe 20 miles, so it was extremely rare for you to pass another car, let alone another person at this time. It didn't help that the locals said, stay out of the woods at night. I was just looking out my window at the woods, and when we were coming up to the light, Next thing I know, the car does a movie turn, like stomp on the brakes to a 180 and freaking burn rubber the other way. I get weirded out and look back through the car and I see the road illuminated by the street light and I see this massive black figure beside the road. It takes one step and it's in the middle of the road. Another step and it's already on the other side. Immediately I look forward, scared out of my mind and look at my cousin and I see the intense fear on his face. We don't say a word to each other and he drops me off. I stay up till sunrise and finally go to sleep. Funny now that I think about it, we never talked about once, not after it happened, but yeah, we saw Bigfoot and the locals do tell very similar stories. Last October, I was in California for roughly 11 days after my brother's wedding in San Diego. I just wanted to drive around the state and visit California places that had captured my imagination over the years, and I love driving almost as much as I love cars. 
I don't necessarily believe in Sasquatch, but I would never discount someone else's experience. Especially if I wasn't there. So off I went. Clipper Mills is in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, about 70 miles northeast of Sacramento. Very near that dam was in the danger of failing last year. Pretty remote. So, after Bodega Bay, I head across the state for my destination, arriving near Sacramento in time for a late dinner. So it's after dark when I set out on the final leg. Very dark. It takes me a good while on all the twisty turning roads to find my way there. I wanted to get to the exact spot the person who posted the video parked that night. He wouldn't say in his video, so I poked around YouTube comment sections and related videos and found out more or less about the spot. Around 11 p.m., I pulled my rented Camry well off the dark two-lane road to avoid any issues with the very sparse traffic. I saw no one whatsoever, so I sat in the darkened interior, listening, allowing my eyes to dark adapt for about 20 minutes. I heard nothing but assorted insects as I sat there, saw nothing move at all. Eventually, not wanting to activate the car's interior lighting, I crawled out of the driver's side window into the black night. Armed with my cell, with no service, a handheld GPS to find my way back should I get lost in the dark, and a red flashlight I use with my telescope. I stand there right by that car window for a solid two minutes before I could screw up the courage to move away from my Camry. Eventually, I walk up the road, still not hearing anything but bugs. Suddenly, without conscious decision to do so, I veer right and head up into the woods. My feet are crunching pine needles now, and to my mind, I sound like Bigfoot stomping around myself. After what was about 20 minutes, I stopped to listen and added to the insects I hear, this faint screeching sound far off in the blackness. And it doesn't sound insect-like at all. It has more consciousness to it. The now also thoroughly dark adapted mind is whispering that it sounds like a person in distress, or a large primate. I remain still. I hear something small scurrying around in the underbrush as well, followed a minute later by that same forlorn sounding wail, but now closer. Time to return to the car. As I'm walking back to the car, I hear this spooky sound. Every 20 to 30 seconds, and now it is coming from behind me and in front of me. Shit. It seems to have a vocabulary of some sort to me now. Different vocalizations, some guttural, some high-pitched, and everywhere in between. My mind is having fun, just messing with me now. I was never so happy to see a Camry in all my life. I started it up before my ass was in the seat, I think, and half expected to see scores of red eyeballs glowing at me in the headlights from the dark forest in front of me. Now spooked, and my mind telling me some homicidal axe-wielding lunatic was nipping at my heels. I went back the way I came at much quicker pace than I had arrived. Out of nowhere, right in front of me, this black lab runs out of the woods on one side of the road and into the woods on the other. I barely missed crushing him. That scared the shit out of me right there. I slowed down a bit, and the thought of nearly mowing down an innocent mutt overcoming my mind. Some hour down the road towards Sacramento is when I noticed I had cell service again. I opened my Expedia app and found a nearby hotel for the night. Once safely enclosed in said hotel room, I began scouring the internet on my iPad and came to the conclusion that what I heard was a barred owl or a western screech owl. Can never be 100% sure I suppose, very creepy though and I'm done with wandering alone in the woods at night, I think. This story isn't mine, it's actually my dad's. Every other summer, him and a few of his friends go over to Maine and do some bass fishing. The encounter happened at around 2 to 3 in the morning. My dad got out of his tent because he had to take a piss. As he was draining himself, he heard a snap about 25 feet away. He looked up and saw nothing. To make sure it wasn't a predator, 
He shone his flashlight over in the general direction. The woods were really thick, so he really didn't see much at all, except for a pair of eyes. He really couldn't tell how high up off the ground they were, so being the person he is, walked towards it, and as he did so, whatever the thing was ran away, and my dad got a better look at it. He says that it was around 8 feet and smelt pretty bad like trash. He told his friends the next day, but they decided to stay the rest of the week due to the fact that my dad didn't feel that the Bigfoot wanted to hurt them, but was just more curious. He came home and told me, and now, a few years later, I'm telling you. I really hope that one day I could see what he saw so I can fully believe that this world is actually a strange one. I have had a lot of paranormal encounters, but this is not my story. This is my mother's. My mom and my uncle had to go pick up my grandmother. She worked in a small town called Red River and the blizzard was so bad that my grandmother's car wasn't turning on. So she told my mom to pick her up and be safe because the roads were very slippery. My mom told my uncle to go with her and they were at the Cuesta, New Mexico and they drove slowly because the storm was so bad. While driving, a large creature started walking across the road. It was about nine feet tall and the creature had white fur and large teeth and it just stared at my mother and uncle, and then it turned away and ran into the woods. They started talking about it that they both agreed that it was a Bigfoot the next day, and my uncle went to the area he found footprints and even took a picture of it. In the mountains of New Mexico, creepy stuff happens every day. It was the summer of 2015, and I was in 12th grade. Me and two other friends went on the camping trip in Alberta, Canada. The drive up was normal. We got to the campsite, and oh yeah, one of my friends who we will call Jeff brought his girlfriend, who we will call Jane. So when we pulled up to our camp spot, we unloaded our gear, then had lunch, and then we went on for a hike around 3 o'clock. We came back around 5.15. And for about four hours, we sat around the campfire telling stupid stories and other stuff like that. But this is when shit gets too real. We started to get the feeling we were being watched, which is weird because there was no one around us for about a whole kilometer. So we thought it just might be a fellow camper. So I yelled out, hey, but no response. So we just ignored it. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of snapping twigs. I looked out of the tent curiously, and what I saw was a creature. About 20 meters away from the tent, it was about 8 feet tall with nut brown hair, and that's all I could really see in the moonlight. So I woke up my friend, and he went pale. He slowly closed the tent zipper and looked at me and said it's right outside. I told him that's impossible because it was just 20 meters away. To start out, my name is Doug, and my father and I are what you would call avid hunters, and we know what is in the woods where we hunt. Well, we took a trip to West Virginia to go black bear hunting. I was back at camp resting from an early morning bear hunt, and my father went out to go hunting for the afternoon, and I knew where he would be in case of emergence. Well, he gets to his spot and stays there till the sun sets, and then he starts to head back to the side by side he took out to get to his spot. On his way back, he heard footsteps, and remember, this is in the mountains where only hunters and rare locals know where they're at. The footsteps he heard were nothing human or bare, and he stopped for a second and kept walking, and then the most blood-curdling yet powerful yell came behind him, and he thought, so this is how it ends well, it will be a hell of a race. If he gets to the side by side, and as soon as he got in something came running up at him and threw a giant rock at him, my father came back to the camp where I was waiting for him. And that was the first time I ever saw my father scared, 
He didn't come out of the camper until it was time to leave, and we left with no further incident whenever we return. Let me start off with a few disclaimers. This isn't my story, it's a friend of my grandfather, and it's been a few years since I was told it, so the memory might be a bit hazy. And it may not be scary to most people, but I thought I would share it anyway. Also, if there are any mistakes in the story, I apologize. At the time of writing this, I was getting over a concussion. The story happened in upstate New York. My grandfather's friend was hunting with one other person. For privacy reasons, I won't use any names of the people in this story. Anyway, they came across a road and decided to split up going in opposite directions on the road. He perched himself on a rock and waited till about four in the afternoon, but nothing showed. At this time, he decided to meet up with his friend. Right when he got off the rock he was sitting on, he saw something walking in the woods across a clearing not far from him. The thing walked out of the trees, and it had its right side facing him. He didn't know if it was a bear or a person, and he didn't know whether to talk to it or not. He then decided to whistle at it. The thing walked away from him on two legs, back into the forest. It disappeared from his sight. It then walked back out of the forest, this time facing him. They stared at each other before the thing walks back into the woods again and out of sight. My grandfather's friend walked back down the road away from the thing he saw, where he saw his friend walking up to him. He asked him if he had been down where he saw the creature. He said he never went down that way. To this day, he insists that it wasn't a bear, because it would have stumbled on two legs, and he swears it wasn't a person, because they would have alerted him of their presence. He insists that it was a Bigfoot. And this is coming from a second-hand source, so you can judge on whether or not it's true, but I hope to find what he saw. What I'm about to tell you is very true. I've never told anyone in my life till now. This happened to me back in 2003 at our family farm in Ohio. It was mid-October and my dad and I were on our way to the farm to deer hunt as we always did every weekend. We arrived there around 5.45 in the morning. We sat in the truck talking and joking about who was going to see more deer or shoot the bigger buck like always. At about 5 till 6, we got out and got our gear on and headed towards the woods. As we entered the woods on the left side of the cow pasture, I noticed an odd, eerie feeling which was normal for me, I guess, as the woods always gave me that feeling, even since I was young. My dad walked me to my tree stand and made sure I got in and situated Slafy. He told me good luck, as always, and I said I'll be back at noon. He then proceeded to his stand a few minutes after he left. This overwhelmingly tingle came over my body, as if someone or something was watching me. At this time, it was still dark. I began to look around the surrounding timber trying to make out silhouettes, but couldn't. I was beginning to become very overwhelmed with that feeling of eyes upon me. A few minutes have passed since I scanned the timber last. I tried once more since my eyes have now adjusted to the dark better. I look off to my left and then slowly towards my right again and nothing. I try to calm myself and mentally say, it's nothing, you're fine. All of a sudden, I hear a crashing coming towards me from the left, and my heart sinks as I look. It was a few deer running for what appeared to be for their life. They blow through the woods and don't stop as I hear them still crashing through the timber at this time. I am only able to make out silhouettes and outlines of trees. I thought that it was odd, but maybe a coyote or something was after them and just shrugged it off. Maybe five minutes later, it's still dark, but dawn approaches. I then feel the hair on my neck stand up, and that eerie feeling comes back upon me. My heart starts to pound profusely. I hear heavy crunching of leaves and loud snaps of sticks from the direction the deer had ran from, which was the neighbor's property. 
On the left side of our woods is 100 plus acres of switchgrass and hundreds of acres of other woods. I look up and see what appears to be my dad walking towards me. Daylight is starting to break now, but it's still pretty dark inside the woods. I wait till what I thought was my dad got about 20 yards plus from me and I quietly say, what are you doing dad? No response, it just continues to walk towards me. So I say a little louder, dad, what are you doing? And still no response. I begin to say, hey, you know you're trespassing buddy, but no response. And as it got to the tree that my deer stand was in, I noticed that it was not my dad. I begin to freak out. I look across the woods to where my dad's tree stand is and I see his flashlight climbing up the tree. And that's when I look down and seen this thing standing directly underneath my tree stand looking dead at me. Whatever it was, it was tall enough to reach up and grab my foot with ease. Mind you, I'm 14 feet up this tree. I began to start crying from fear, and my heart was beating so hard and fast I thought it was going to explode out of my chest. I let out a wimpy, muffled, ah, uh, yell. It just grumbled at me and walked off following the direction of the deer. I watched it disappear into the timber as the darkness was fading fast. Once it was gone, I was overwhelmed with this god-awful smell of body odor, mixed with the smell of death, old hound dog, and trash. As the morning went on, the woods was dead silent. Not a bird, squirrel, or deer. Nothing. I've never heard the woods that quiet before, ever. Once I calmed down enough to climb down and out of my tree, I ran to my dad and told him I wanted to leave now, that I didn't feel well, so we left. This happened to me when I was 15. I'm now 29 and I've never hunted our woods in the morning again. I will not be there after dark to this day and I still have not told anyone till now. I do not smoke, drink, or do drugs. Never have I promised. This is a 100% true story and the scariest thing that's ever happened. In tonight's episode, we cover five hair-raising encounters with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and what others believe to be some wild beast in the wilderness. From footprints found in the wintertime to having rocks and logs thrown at you, let the encounters begin. Story 1 Born and raised in Oklahoma, and have been my whole life. I grew up fishing, tracking, everything you could possibly want to do in the outdoors. My entire family is that way, and I raise my boys the same way. However, I've never been one to believe in all of the silly fairy tales that people spew about Bigfoot and other silly animals that live in the woods and apparently exist. Until one day, me and my oldest son had a strange encounter when we went to go fishing at one of our local creeks we like to frequent. It was a beautiful sunny day in June of 99, and we thought we'd make a good day of it and go pack some food and have a good day fishing, just father and son. Well, we got everything loaded up and got the tackle box and our poles and headed out. The creek we were heading to is roughly about 20 minutes away from our house since we kind of live a little bit out of town. When we got to the creek, all seemed well and lively. The water was rushing pretty quick. Even though it was June, the stream was still ice cold, which is always great to stick your feet into just after getting there and you've been walking around and it's very hot. This particular spot, it's a pretty typical creek bed, but there is a lot of bushes and brush scattered throughout the area. And I'm talking tall bushes that are like six to seven feet tall. It's definitely not clear and open, 
so you have to kind of find a nice spot along the riverbank to fish. We found a nice spot to sit down, and we began to unpack our food and get our tackle box and poles all set up. As I'm sitting there helping my son, I notice my son's attention is not on what we're doing. Instead, he's looking over my shoulder with the most confused look on his face, seeming quite distracted. I thought that was pretty odd since my son's favorite pastime is fishing, and I never lose his attention to anything other than fishing. So I turn my head to see what he's looking at, and I think maybe it's a bear or something, but I was wrong. About 30 feet away, behind a 5 foot bush, was this face peeking out, staring at both of us. It looked humanoid but also had a very Neanderthal-like quality to it, with hair all around it, and more of a cone-shaped kind of head. The cheeks were bare, and the skin looked very leathery, but there was hair all over the face. The eyes were dark, and I couldn't really make out any pupils. Its nose was like ours, not like a gorilla's. I wasn't really sure what it was at first. Once it realized both of us were staring at it, it immediately popped its head back down. My son starts freaking out, wondering what on earth it was looking at us. I was starting to freak out a little bit too, but I just wanted to chalk it up to somebody playing a treat trick on us with some sort of stupid Hollywood mask. So I yelled out, whoever you are, leave now. I have a gun on me. And this thing, faster than I could have ever imagined, bolted out from behind this bush into the wood line about another 70 to 80 feet. Now, I want to remind you that this is total daylight, so we're able to see everything pretty clearly. This thing was about 5 to 6 feet tall and pretty hairy. I mean, I'm talking full black hair. If a black bear could be walking on two legs and running like a human could, you would pretty much be nailing it except for the cone-shaped head and no neck. It didn't really look like it had much of a neck, and its arms swayed back and forth. It was also very barrel body shaped and built like a tank. It never looked back as it ran, and I've never seen anyone or anything run so fast. As soon as it hit the wood line, it disappeared. My son, for the rest of the day, kept wondering what on earth it was that we saw. I told him that we would talk about it later, and to try and just enjoy our fishing trip. Well, we didn't really fish there for long before he was just too uncomfortable, and so we left to go back home. On the drive home, my son is in a stupor, and he asks me, Did we see a Bigfoot? I told him that Bigfoot isn't real, and it must have just been somebody trying to pull a prank on us. Looking back, I was really naive to think that. I've told this encounter to a couple of friends of mine who are Bigfoot enthusiasts, and they informed me that what I probably experienced was a juvenile Bigfoot, since it appeared a lot more curious and playful than it ever did territorial or aggressive in any way. I'm not really freaked out now, but whatever it was, it was very strange. I felt weird for me and my son seeing what it was. Now that my son is all grown up, he still goes fishing in that exact same spot, but we've never really talked about the experience since, and I've never brought it back up. Story 2 This is a story that my grandfather had told me back from when he was younger. He's had property in his generation for a long time, and him and his father used to hunt on their property out in Texas. As of currently, our family had moved to Minnesota, and that is where we've been currently residing for a long time. We actually don't even visit the old property anymore, and have it in ages. My grandfather has been hunting since he was just a boy, and so he's a fairly experienced woodsman who doesn't really ever fear much. It still gives me chills to this day to hear this encounter, because my grandfather still gets shaken up every time he recounts it. My grandfather hunted all sorts of game, deer, coyotes, squirrels, you name it. They had a lot of property to work with, so he had a lot of time on his hands to really learn the woods around him and get a good feel for the game in the area. 
There was even wild turkey that would run around there from time to time, so there was plenty to hunt all season long. This particular day ended with him taking a route that he didn't normally take to venture out to a different part of the property that he wasn't used to. Him and his father had several different routes they would take on their property to go venture off and different spots to go hunt. After making it maybe a mile is when he started to hear strange vocalizations and other bizarre noises in the woods around him. At first, he told me he thought it was a bird, but he said there's no birds in the woods that sound like these noises did. They would come and go, so he kind of wrote them off at first, but they started getting louder and more frequent, but he kept venturing further because my grandfather isn't afraid of anything. After venturing maybe another mile is when he started to get hit with a very strong skunk musk odor that was said to smell like rotting meat and skunk. My grandfather described it like coming upon a pile of a hundred dead rotting skunks just sitting in the sun and baking. He said it was so strong there'd be times it was hard not to want to gag and vomit. He said he kept looking around, but didn't see anything, but started to get the overwhelming feeling that he was being watched. At this point, he knew something was up. He couldn't find the trace of the smell, and things were getting more eerie as time went on. He also told me that as he ventured around the area, there were times where he would run into stuff that didn't quite look right, like markers that weren't quite man-made is what he said like they might have been markings from animals or something. He told me about how he found smaller trees that were ripped up out of the ground and turned upside down and pulled back into the ground. What's scary is this is back in the 1940s, and their property was pretty large, as well as being private, so nobody was going to be hanging out on their property doing anything like this. And if so... Who's going to rip up all these small trees out of the ground? And who's going to have enough strength to drive them back into the ground? This was really unsettling. My grandfather also believes he stumbled upon a small den of whatever it was he was smelling. He said he also found a small cave opening that opened up into a cave that he estimated to be roughly 30 square feet. But the stench of the dead skunk smell was where it was coming from. He also said he could see bones just from the cave entrance alone and decided it was probably a good idea to head back home. Although they were the bones of deer from what he gathered, he didn't want to take any chances. He told me that as he was leaving the den, he started to get an extremely overwhelming feeling of dread and felt the need to get the hell out of there. That's when he noticed rocks starting to be thrown in his direction. And I'm not talking about little pebbles. I'm talking rocks the size of a tire literally being thrown through the woods about 10 to 20 feet near him. This was obviously enough, so he was so scared he booked it out of there and got back home as fast as he could. He said whatever was throwing those rocks at him had to be incredibly strong and obviously not a human. He said there was some sort of stomping and screaming noises that were going on as soon as he was leaving the den. Something was trying to drive him out of the area, and whatever it was, was close by. He tells me there were multiple of these things, not even 50 feet away, but he couldn't see them. After that, he still continues to hunt on his property, but not near as much as he used to, and he never went beyond where he went before. He continued to stay in new areas. His father never said much about it, and I guess there was never really a whole lot to discuss, since back then especially, you'd be practically crazy if you ever brought it up. The property ended up getting passed down to him once his father died, and not long after that, he moved to Minnesota due to his career. Story 3 My fiance and I love camping and always do stuff in the outdoors. We're usually pretty avid hikers and explorers. We've gone through many different trails, hikes, and many adventures out in the woods. 
I have never noticed anything out of the ordinary or even out of place, although I am a firm believer in the paranormal and Bigfoot, and other weird occurrences that do happen, although I have never really experienced them until this particular event that I am about to talk to you about. Me and my fiance decided to camp at one of our favorite lakes, Lake Dewey in Michigan. We've camped here several times before and have always had a great experience, so this time would be no different, or so we thought. It was later September, and I remember because it was still pretty warm, but the cold crisp in the air of fall had not yet set in. We had a pretty typical fun day on the lake. We hung out, we hiked, we hung out in our tent before going back out and hiking again and then coming back for dinner to relax for the evening. But by the end of the first night, my boyfriend was acting strange. He was getting really quiet and not talking as much as he normally does, which I just chalked it up to him being exhausted since we did had a long day. We ended up putting up the fire and turning in for the night. I noticed he seemed on edge and had a rough time falling asleep, but he didn't mention anything even when I asked him if he was okay. I sacked right out and woke up the next morning no problems, feeling well rested and ready to take on the next day. Him? Not so much. He didn't look so good and seemed like he was still on edge from yesterday. After getting up and eating breakfast and going on the next hike, the day seemed pretty normal and we decided to get ready to go back to camp as it was starting to become later in the afternoon. That's when he set me down and told me that he had been feeling uncomfortable since yesterday. When I asked him what was wrong, he just said he didn't feel right about where we were and that he felt like we were being looked at and watched very closely. I assured him that he was just paranoid and it was silly to think like that. Nothing was out here. Nothing was going to get us. I convinced him to stay with me another night but he seemed so apprehensive about it. Now, it was bothering me how weird he was acting because it's not like him. Usually, he's one of those guys that is the first to come up with crazy hiking trails and spots for us to check out. He was always the first one of us to want to explore dangerous territory and stuff that were never meant to be explored. This night was a little calmer and I feel like we both checked in a little earlier than normal. I ended up staying up and thinking around on my cell phone while my boyfriend just lay there trying to fall asleep. The evening had been pretty dead. We hadn't really talked a whole lot after heading back to camp. It was just kind of blah. After he sat me down and told me what he did earlier, I had been kind of on on edge but just tried to play it off. It was pretty late at night if I remember right. I want to say my phone said something like 11.32, and this is where we started to hear footsteps go through our campsite. And I mean heavy footsteps. And then the breathing started. I started to feel really uneasy, and I just kept hearing a thud for every step that was taken. I started to panic because I wasn't sure if this was a bear we were dealing with or someone who was trying to hurt us. I looked over to my boyfriend and asked him if he heard what I was hearing, and he was already as white as a ghost and nodded right at me. I sat there scared, looking at the door of my tent, trying to listen for any sound I could. The sound had ceased for a while, and all I heard was the night air. The stomping would stop for a couple of moments, and then it would resume. Whatever it was was stomping around in circles around our tent, but it wasn't really getting into any of our stuff like a bear would. It's like it was casing our tent or something. It made me feel so nervous. Whatever it was kept getting really close to the tent, and we could hear it breathing heavily. It must have been huge because it sounded like it was a 10 foot tall man. Either that, or it was a bison on two legs walking around our campsite. For the next few hours, this would go on and off until roughly 3 or 4 in the morning, and we could finally fall asleep. We didn't even notice the noises stopping and the feeling of dread went away. I think my boyfriend and I fell asleep from just sheer exhaustion and panic. We still do not talk about it to this day, and when we got up the next morning, we didn't even speak 
we just booked it out of there and packed up as quickly as we could. Could it have been a Bigfoot from what we saw or heard? Probably. Could it have been someone rummaging through our camp? I don't know. Whatever it was, I don't think I'll ever go back to that lake. Story 4 Me and my brother Travis have been going out hunting together for as long as I can remember. Back when my pa, God rest his soul, used to take us when we were little, he always told us how impressed he was because of how quickly we were able to catch on and learn about the area around us and things we would notice like tracks, markings, sounds. It was great. We didn't actually start going hunting though with him until we were a little older, around 9 or 10, and we instantly fell in love with it. Our pa passed away from cancer when we were roughly about 17 and 16 respectively, since my little brother is only about a year, year and a half younger than I, and it just quite hasn't been the same since. So, to honor that, me and my brother make it a ritual to try and go out together every year and hunt and keep it going. The family line depends on it. Our uncle has had some property that has been passed down for quite a few generations that me and my brother and Pa have hunted on for ages. These past five years specifically though, we had been going to different places to hunt and it just wasn't quite the same as our uncle's property. So this year we had decided we were going to go back to our uncle's and give it a go. We contacted him and got the okay and we'd shown up there in the early morning Luckily for us, there's several different tree stands set up all throughout my uncle's property. He's got about 80 plus acres of just deep woods. We are in Montana after all, and a really, really nice cabin styled house that we sometimes like to sleep in when we visit before we go out camping. Anyway, we knew this time the usual tree stands we wanted to hit. We got there that early morning and got all geared up and ready to go. It was clear my brother was going to take a stand about a half mile away from the stand I was in. We were both going to go in about two to three miles deep into the woods to get to this one specific spot we both knew of. It was actually a pretty good clearing, and there are many bucks and does that were usually sighted here, so we knew this was the prime spot. We got all ready and headed out to the designated spots we needed to go. I wished my brother luck, and he did to me as well. I climbed up into my tree stand once I made it and sat there and I waited. Usually, when I get to my tree stand, it's hard for me to not want to get totally relaxed and just be comfortable. I love it. I love it being out in nature and hunting. That's where I belong, and I've always felt so at peace. The sunlight was barely breaking through. It couldn't have been any later than 5 or 6 in the morning. I don't remember exactly. I thought it was weird though that I didn't notice any wildlife really teeming in the area as we had made our hike back to these stands. I didn't think anything of it at the time though. An hour had gone by and nothing. The woods were so unusually quiet and all the life in it was gone. I mean there wasn't a sign of anything around. I thought it was so odd. It was a lot long after that that I started hearing weird noises coming through the woods. I couldn't really place the direction around me to where it was coming from. I just knew it was coming around me from close by. I just figured at first that it was a big buck finally coming through the area since it sounded so heavy. I kept hearing brush crushing and twigs snapping. The only issue is the heavy thudding and footsteps I was hearing didn't sound like it was coming from a four-footed animal. It sounded like it was a heavy person, but it sounded way too heavy to be a person. I started to hear what I can only describe as whooping-like noises and other strange sounds. I started to get nervous. The sounds began getting louder and louder, and as I looked out of my tree stand to see if I could spot what it was. I locked eyes on it. Coming into the woods from the clearing not even 50 yards away from me was this giant hairy man. I quickly ducked my head down to make sure it didn't see me, and every step it took was a deep thud, and I could hear it wheezing and breathing hard. I heard it walk its way towards me, and then as it approached my stand and got close, it slowed down. 
I was so terrified I wasn't sure what to do. I gripped my rifle tightly, praying I wouldn't have to use it in this confrontation because I knew I wouldn't make it standing out against this thing. It slowly passed underneath me and kept on going. I waited for it to be gone completely before I even moved a muscle. It felt like an eternity. I quickly opened the hatch and got down out of my stand, and by instinct, I ran to my brother's stand where I knew he'd be. Only being half a mile away, I knew it wouldn't be too far, and if I can get past the thing that walked right under my stand, I would probably be okay. The woods were still quiet, which made me so nervous because that means it was still in the area. I made it to my brother's stand in probably 10 minutes, or even less. He was also as pale as a ghost. I explained to him what had happened, and he didn't really say much. He just said we needed to leave, and so we hightailed it out of there. I've been hunting for years and years, and I've never seen anything or encountered anything like I did that morning. It wasn't until we got back to the truck that my brother was telling me he saw the same thing walking near his tree stand, and that he doesn't believe this creature saw him or even meant any harm. He's probably right, but it's something that I don't want to have happen ever again. It honestly scared me to death and I haven't been able to go back to my uncle's property and hunt since. My brother was able to get over it and move on, but he will never talk about it. And since then, we found other areas and places to hunt on. I think we've kind of just collectively have decided to not go back, even if it is kind of an unspoken rule. Whatever is running around on my uncle's property, keep it far away from me. Story 5 When I was in my early 20s, I loved going out in the wintertime and exploring as much as I could. It was my favorite season to go out and hike in. Everything was so magical, and even though it was cold, the temperature and climates never pushed me away. Even though most people never went outdoors in that time, I always dressed accordingly. My favorite thing would be to go down all the abandoned logging roads and just pull off and start exploring. Usually those are the best parts because so much of those woods around there are untouched. Of course, I like to really go and explore just about every season there is, but winter is just so unique. I'm not really a hunter by trade or a woodsman, I just like to hike and explore. But I do have many good friends that are avid outdoorsmen and hunters. Now, there is always something to see and explore, no matter really what season you're in. I often take weapons with me, like elephant knives and the such, just in case I would run into a bear or a mountain lion or anything that would put me in a bad situation. In this particular time, as I was exploring the area around, I came across what appeared to be extremely large tracks down by this little frozen river a few miles into the woods. I've always been pretty neutral about the whole Bigfoot phenomena, but this was amazing to witness firsthand. I don't know if really anybody else comes out this way, and if they do, I seriously doubt they're going to bring a fake foot imprint on the ground. This was a dried up old creek bed that looked like it had been not used for a long time, like maybe it had dried up years and years ago, because the footprints looked like they had been old and frozen. I think what really got me was the overall impression of the footprint. You could tell it was set pretty deep into the frozen ground. Now, these footprints weren't exactly in the snow, more so in an area where the snow was receding and the ground was still totally frozen and it looked like the footprints had been there prior to snowfall. You can tell that whatever made this footprint, or these footprints, must have been extremely heavy. The footprints had easily been 16 inches or more, and were only faded a little bit, so they were pretty well preserved, but I think that was due to the cold, frigid temps. It was interesting to note that there were five clearly defined toes in the footprint, as well as no real arch. It was clearly a bipedal footprint I was looking at. The footprints loosely were around the riverbank and went into the direction of the woods. What's even crazier is the stride. The stride between the footprints was roughly five to six feet. What on earth would have that kind of stride out here? 
I didn't really feel like even trying to figure out what it could be. I thought about following the footprints, but I immediately considered that being a bad idea just because one, I don't know what animal made them, and two, it was in a totally different direction than the way I wanted to go. I'm an explorer, but I'm not stupid enough to potentially put myself in a dangerous situation, especially when I am not familiar with what I'm dealing with. I don't have any casting material or any of that stuff with me, nor do I ever carry it because I don't make molds of tracks. This just happened to be tracks that I happened to run into. I ended up going back to my car some time later, and driving back home, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I have a few friends of mine who are close with me that are Bigfoot enthusiasts, so I brought it up with them, and they were ecstatic that I told them about this. Not only did they tell me I ran into Bigfoot footprints, but they also shared with me some of their own hair-raising encounters that they had out in those same woods. You know, at this point, I don't know if Bigfoots really do exist, but I definitely can say that those footprints are pretty unexplainable, and I have no idea what animal made them. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe to What Lurks Beneath and leave a comment and a like. All of it helps my channel grow. Keep your eyes peeled for WhatLurksBeneath.com coming soon where you can submit your very own scary story directly to me and have it read on this channel and heard by thousands. We'll be having new merchandise coming soon down the line as well as a weekly podcast series coming out. Many great things are on the horizon. Stay tuned, fans. I've never given Bigfoot, or any supposed animal that doesn't exist, any real thought in my life. That is, until I went camping back in the fall of 2005. My place of choice was Mount Adams in Washington State. I do things pretty unethically and probably quite dangerous to most. I usually start off at a trailhead and go completely off trail, using only my compass to guide me back in the right direction. I was pretty good at doing what I do, so I knew I wasn't too uncomfortable with the concept of the whole thing. I remember the leaves were just starting to change color, so this was probably earlier in October. I remember I had hiked miles and miles the very first day, set up camp, got up the next morning, went again for another five to seven miles before toning it down that evening and settling down early. I had probably hiked at this point an accumulative 12 to 13 miles so far, and I wanted to make sure I rested a lot this very evening. What was really nice about the spot that I set up camp at is that I was only a couple hundred yards away from a rather large creek. This enabled me to use water for multiple purposes, including cooking with. That night itself went pretty normal. Everything was beautiful out. The stars were out, the sounds of the forest, it was wonderful, and I slept pretty well until the following morning. I remember waking up about five or six in the morning, or so I think, to some weird gibberish chirping sounds, probably about 200 or so feet away if I had to guess properly. The sounds seemed pretty distant, but close enough that I could actually hear kind of what was going on. These sounds sounded like people on speed talking as fast as they could. It was the weirdest thing. I remember thinking to myself, why would there be anyone out here? I'm at least 13 miles away from any trailhead. I just laid there though with my eyes shut trying to drift back off to sleep, but this gibbering sound is all I could think of to call it kept going on and on. And finally, I got curious and wanted to see what was going on. So I got out of my sleeping bag and poked my head out of the tent. Now from right where my head pokes out of the tent, I had a pretty clear view of the creek from where I could see, and there was enough trees and brush that I was kind of concealed, I guess you would say. Like if there was a bear or some predator at the creek, I don't think it would necessarily see me, but again, I had a pretty clear view. I remember I looked over in the direction of the creek, and I was stunned by what I saw. There were two 
humanoid figures, I guess we'll call them. One was black and extremely hairy. The other one was almost a pale white with a little bit of gray. The pale gray one was taller and larger than the black one. If I had to guess sizes, of course, just based around the rocks around them, I would say the black one was maybe five to six feet tall, while the pale gray one was probably eight to nine feet tall. The pale gray one was obviously much larger in girth and overall size. Even the muscle mass was a huge difference between the two. I couldn't really make out any faces or anything other than just seeing these large shapes, but I remember hearing the gibbering noises go on and on, and it sounded like it was coming from them. They were moving their arms around like they were lost in conversation with one another, and they were literally standing right at the bed of the creek. I was in such shock and disbelief, and so bummed out I didn't even have my Kodak camera or anything to take a picture of these things with. I was pretty sure what I was witnessing was two Bigfoots having a conversation or something like that. Although I don't know if you could really call that conversation, it was just these weird high-pitched gibbering noises that I guess would be their communication. I'm not sure. This went on for a little while longer and I watched them out of curiosity. I never sensed any fear or felt anything bad. Just watch them sit there, move their arms around, and talk to one another. And then, before I knew it, they kind of just disappeared. They moved out of view really quickly, but the gibbering noises and sounds still kept going on, although I could tell it was moving farther and farther away. It's really crazy to me because I know that the Pacific Northwest is supposed to be known for Bigfoot, but I never actually ever believed in that and I didn't think I would be running into any of them at all in my camping expeditions, let alone two. After they left, I got back in my tent and got everything ready to go, and I actually tried to head back to where I came from, just in case I didn't want to wander into their territory or anything like that. I have no idea what kind of animals those things were, and I didn't want to be on the aggressive side of any one of these things. Even though I wasn't scared at all, I feel like this whole experience just taught me to be a whole lot more aware of your surroundings and to be open-minded to the unknown, even though there's things out there that are supposedly not supposed to exist. I saw with my very own eyes two of those things. I don't know if Bigfoot are supposed to be a type of people or an animal or even supernatural, but whatever they are, I must have been close to maybe a den or a village, or whatever it is that they migrate and live in altogether. I've told my experiences to a few friends of mine, and they actually tell me that it sounds like I encountered an elderly Bigfoot talking to a younger juvenile Bigfoot, which I thought was extremely interesting. I guess white and gray Bigfoots aren't as common, but I guess they are seen from time to time and I don't know if it's because of their age or what it is that causes them to be that color. But then it was also interesting to see a shorter one, which would make sense that maybe that one was a juvenile that was talking to an elder one. Maybe that really did mean that there was a village nearby or something like that. I'm not quite sure, but it would make a lot of sense since Mount Adams, I guess, is kind of a hot spot for a UFO and Bigfoot encounters, I later on found out. And like I said, I was at least 10 plus miles off of any trailhead. It would be impossible for really anyone else to be out there in a big hairy gorilla costume of any kind. There's no reason anybody would travel 10 plus miles out in the middle of the forest to do such a thing. And for what reason? Not to mention, those Bigfoot sounds were just not human. Hello, What Lurks Beneath. I'm here to tell you about several different experiences that I've had with Bigfoot or Sasquatch in my lifetime. Everything from having rocks thrown at me, to this thing charging at my trailer, to seeing this thing face to face. Back when I was in my earlier 20s, I want to say probably 25, I had gotten my first RV and decided to take it into some of the mountains down in California. Now I drove that sun bitch all around, I want you to know that. 
I lived in that thing, and it was my baby for quite some time. But there were a few times that I felt strange things happen, or that there was maybe a strange presence outside my RV, if that makes any sense. The time that really stands out to me in particular was there was one night that I was sleeping in my camper when I started to hear these little pop, pop, pop sounds against my trailer. Then they started to get louder and heavier and start turning into thuds. Then I realized that I was having rocks and pebbles thrown at my trailer. What the hell? I thought. I'm out here in the middle of the woods by myself at three in the morning. I'm pretty much butt naked and I run outside my trailer and look around. It's pitch black and there's nothing but the stars in the sky. There's no person, there's no sounds, only crickets. I'm not sure what on earth was pelting my trailer, but I walk over to the side in which I heard the noise and there's a bunch of rocks and pebbles all along the base of the RV, along with little dents from all the rocks being thrown. Something or someone was throwing rocks. I want you to keep in mind that these kind of events happen to me all over the state of California. There was really no specific location that these things happened or didn't happen. They would just happen from time to time, some worse than others. There would be times where I'd be hiking out in the woods by myself, and I would hear wood knocking, screams, and other really strange sounds that I couldn't quite explain. Actually, if you get on YouTube right now and type in Bigfoot screams, I believe there's an audio clip that's taken from Eastern Oregon, at least I think. If you listen to that, that actually pretty closely matches what I would hear sometimes off in the woods, along with the wood knocking. Another time, I was hiking alone and I'm pretty sure I stumbled into these things territory by accident. I remember I had passed several, well, what they would probably indicate as markers. These were trees that were literally ripped and uprooted of the ground, turned upside down and broken apart and in pieces. It was the strangest sight. If any of you want to know what I'm talking about, simply go to Google Images and look for Bigfoot markers and Bigfoot upside down trees to get an idea of what I'm talking about. I didn't believe that those things could happen like that, but Unfortunately, when you come face to face with these things, it's an unfortunate reality. I had walked past these markers a little ways and noticed the wilderness around me go dead silent. And that's when I started to feel a little uneasy. I was right next to a ridge and something in my gut told me to look up. And at that top of the ridge, maybe 20 feet away from me, was the largest what I would call Bigfoot that I could ever have imagined seeing in my life. This thing was a behemoth. It was massive. Not only did it have the largest barrel body I've ever seen, but it looked like a silverback gorilla on steroids. I'm talking easily 9 to 10 feet tall, and I can't even measure the girth because it was just so massive. The muscles itself were humongous. But the most haunting part of that whole experience was the intent look that it was giving me. It had a very Neanderthal looking face, a very pronounced brow ridge and large nose and lips. The eyes were dark, but not pitch black. I can kind of see them from only about 25 feet away. This thing just glared at me menacingly. Its body language and entire demeanor was basically holding its ground and defending its territory. If I had to summarize the way it was looking at me, it was basically telling me to leave now. You bet your sweet ass I wasn't going to be trying to challenge an animal this large, hell no. Anyway, I just wanted to share these minute details with you, and in the future, I might go ahead and send you a really full, in-depth encounter that I had in Colorado. What I'm about to share with you now is my actual father's encounter that he had back when he was in his 20s. Yes, when I mean my actual encounter, I'm talking about me, what lurks beneath, my father's actual Bigfoot encounter. He's told me about it many times growing up, but I thought it would be really cool to share with you guys in a Bigfoot encounters video. So this is my father's encounter. Back in 1973, 
It was around summertime. This occurred in the outskirts of Davie, Florida, where much of the land at the time remained undeveloped, except for the thousands of acres of orange groves and citrus fruits. Reportings at the time on the news talked of a skunk ape. Those of you who are more familiar with Bigfoot and Sasquatch will know that the skunk ape is the same creature that's commonly seen in the Florida Everglades. There are still many sightings to this day. I was out at my cousin's place, who lived in a groundkeeper's house for the orange groves around. We were out in the thicket of the Everglades. There was only one road at the time that extended about 25 miles, which connected Highway 27 to Alligator Alley going east and west. Like I said, I was with my cousin Gary and three of my close friends. It was roughly 8 p.m., and it was fairly dark outside. We were just hanging out and talking when out of nowhere, our nostrils get assaulted by this foul-smelling odor. The only way I could describe it was a grotesque, strong musk-like odor. I've smelt skunks in my day, and even though the potency of the odor was the same, this smell was distinctly different but still had that wild animal smell to it. The smell freaked us out because, in our minds, it instantly went to skunk ape with all the recent reports on the news. Let me give you a better layout of the property. My cousin Gary's house was surrounded on all three sides of orange groves that extended for miles out to the Everglades. Other than that, he had a long front yard with a driveway that led right to the road. We started hearing commotion and rustling out in the orange grove somewhere out of the darkness. I would estimate it being close by the house. The smell started getting stronger, so we all got up, turned on the outside lights. Whatever it was was out towards the back side of the property. It was beyond the realm of light of the yard and was remaining hidden in the darkness because it did not want to be seen. We all armed ourselves with guns. We had rifles, pistols. We were ready to take this thing out. My cousin had a high caliber elephant gun. He also had a 30 caliber machine gun, semi-automatic as well. One of us had a 22. Another had a 357 Magnum. We ran outside to the backyard to see if we could spot anything. We couldn't see anything with the darkness being as thick as it was. We were yelling at it, taunting it to show itself, but things remained quiet. And then after a few moments, we heard a huge branch breaking. I would say it was within 10 feet of where the lights stopped. This thing was close by. I don't know what it was, but it was intelligent enough to remain hidden. We were loaded up and were going to kill whatever it was had it shown itself. Things got silent after that, and the smell eventually dissipated. We remained outside for a few more moments, laughed it off, and went back inside to resume the night. We spent the night, and the next morning, we wanted to go out and investigate the tracks to look for any evidence or anything like that. What we found the next morning was a 10-inch diameter branch ripped straight from the tree, exactly where we had heard the branch rip last night. Something was strong enough to rip this right off the tree. Things get a little more interesting though. Shortly after, my brother Dominic went into the Everglades to see if he could search and find anything. He was probably searching a few miles away when he stumbled across a cave that he believed the den of a large animal. This den was huge and said it was roughly 10 feet across. He said he found bones of miscellaneous animals and a terrible odor. Whatever he found spooked him enough that he got the hell out of there. We don't have bears down there, and there's no predators in the Everglades that would have a den like this. He said this was a well-constructed den, enough that it scared him shitless, and he was very familiar with mountain lions and other predators that are in America, and that are even natural to Florida. There were also reports during this time that a horse had been found nearby with its head torn off its body completely. 
We all knew of this report, and my brother put two and two together, and put this as him finding the den to whatever the hell ripped the horse's head right off. Now you tell me, what the hell could possibly be strong enough to rip the head off a horse's body? Do you have any idea the sheer amount of force and strength that would take? I haven't had any experiences like what I've described to you since. Florida has since become much more developed since the early 70s, and it's possible much of the area we had our original encounter in is no longer there. It just makes you wonder what's truly out there waiting for you. My wife, daughter, and I went camping over the holiday weekend. We both took off work Friday and headed off to meet up with a group of friends who were camping with their kids and dogs for the holiday weekend. They were already out there and had found a nice campsite that was big enough for our entire group. Just a spot off of a service road with primitive fire pits and not an official campground. In total, there were ten of us, seven adults, and three tweens. We were camping out in an area south of Mount Rainier in Washington State, just outside of the park boundary off of a road that would lead you to a locked gate that enters the park. We knew at the end of the road was a locked gate because all the cars that went that way only to flip back around because it was only accessible to National Park staff. We set up our camp in a flat area that would fit our two tents that they had racked up for us prior to arriving. It was a bit closer to the road than their tents were, and they had set up their tents much further back. Once camp was set up, we hung out with our friends while the kids played and had dinner around the fire. Just friends hanging out, having drinks, hanging around the fire, and all was great. We stayed up pretty late, and everybody was getting tired and cold. Slowly, everyone faded off to their tents and to bed. My wife was cold and went to warm up in the car, and then proceeded to fall asleep in the car. Now my daughter and I are the last two awake out by the fire, and she decides that she wanted to sleep in the car too, where it was warm with my wife. I agreed that that was okay. After I attempted to wake my wife up, and get her to come to the tent to go to sleep, and she was out cold. So I watched her go to the tent and grab her blanket and her sleeping bag for my wife as it went cold, and I had turned off the car by now. She grabbed the stuff and zipped up the tent, and off to the car she went. I myself stayed up just a little bit longer by the fire, and must have dozed off momentarily, because when I woke back up, I was sitting in a camping chair by only glowing embers and it was pitch black. Only the coals of the fire were glowing red and glowing in the now dead fire. I got up and found my way to the tent in the pitch blackness of the night and climbed in and went to sleep. I was exhausted and fell asleep as soon as I hit the sleeping bag. Around 3.30 in the morning, I wake up to my daughter's tent kind of rustling and what sounded like two female voices talking really softly. I listened intently, trying to hear what they were saying, but I couldn't really understand anything. There were no real discernible words coming out, just mumbling, then silence. I figured it was just my wife and daughter finding their way to my daughter's tent, not wanting to wake me up being loud. Figured my wife was just going to sleep in the tent with my daughter. However, now I am upset because my back is killing me because the air mattress is now flat and airless. As I lie there in what I can only describe as dead silence, I hear cracking like sticks breaking or popping, so I assume it is the fire still hanging on somehow. Then I hear something moving around towards the front of my tent, and it stops. Something is directly outside the front of my tent. I can feel it. I can sense it, so I slowly raise up to a seated position and hear something breathe in and exhale a large breath. This is the heaviest breath I have ever heard, and it was followed by what I can only describe as a very loud huff, as it, it was from a horse or a cow, 
or some very large animal. I sat there frozen with fear, trying to rationalize what it is I'm hearing, and it stopped. All I heard was one deep inhale, and exhale, and that huff sound. Then everything went silent. What followed next is an owl hooting just a little ways off back from behind the area our friends tents, and after that I heard nothing else. No sounds at all. No fire popping, no sticks cracking, nothing. I stayed there, sitting up frozen with fear for what seemed like forever, until I could tell the sun was coming up and that it was light out now. I mustered up the courage and go outside and check the ground in front of my tent, and that's when I noticed my daughter's tent unzipped and empty. I panicked and rushed to the car, and there in the car, sound asleep. I see not a single track, nothing around our tents, and everyone else is about 20 to 30 yards away in their tents. Now I am freaking the hell out. Who did I hear talking? Who was skulking around the tent? What the hell was that breathing in front of me and huffing outside my tent? What opened my daughter's tent zipper? Surely there is an explanation, and I sit out there for at least an hour getting the fire going as our friends begin to get up and move about. They slowly make their way out to the fire, and I immediately start asking them where they were and were their dogs all night. Did you let them out? Where were they? Were they sniffing around the tent? Did any of you wake up and were talking or moving around? And did you hear the owl? Nope, no, no, and no, they all replied. I have no idea what that talking softly was and what was breathing and huffing right in front of me. What the hell opened my daughter's tent in the middle of the night? I watched her zip it shut and go to the car. That breath and huff was so scary that it left me frozen with fear. I didn't move at all after hearing it and sat there as silent as possible, not even wanting to breathe. One of the scariest moments of my life, something large and unknown in the darkness directly in front of me, and the only thing separating us is a thin tent wall. This all happened Friday into Saturday morning, and we still have another night here. I decided that I am not sleeping in the tents, and neither are my wife and daughter tonight or ever again. The rest of the day goes great. Hanging out, having breakfast, went into town, Ashford, and went for a hike down the road to Lake Cora. Basically just camping and hanging out. It's getting later now, and although the sun is out and blue skies, the canopy in our camping area is thick and even at the brightest point in the day, was still pretty dark compared to the road area. As we're hanging out, we hear whoops way off in the distance, and we're thinking, what was that? More time passes, and by now a few of the people that were there when we arrived at the camp have now left. Just seven of us left, and two of the seven were pretty much always in their tent so that left five of us out hanging out by the fire. That's when dusk crept in, and my buddy began working on dinner for all of us. As we sat there, from off in the woods between us and the park boundary, towards the creek, we hear these blood-curdling screams and wood-type howls that everybody heard. We all stopped talking and fell silent, and we all began to ask each other, what the fuck was that? We heard this about four to five times. It sounded like a woman being murdered, and a howl type of sound, I don't know. I know sometimes a cougar will make a very similar sound of a woman dying, but this sounded nothing like that. Then came a few tree knocks from the same general direction. Is someone messing with us out here? Everyone was thinking. Keep in mind, it is a holiday weekend, so tons of campers within a 15 mile radius. So I call my buddy over and he hadn't heard the screams because he had been cooking on a skillet and had a propane lantern in front of him and behind him and they are loud. We stand there and listen and don't hear it. We decide, okay, we will do a tree knock back closer to the road that divided us from where the area we heard these vocalization and knocks from. 
That is when we heard it. I got a chill down my spine to my core and the hairs raised up on my arms and neck. We both looked at one another and at the same time asked, did you hear that? I asked him what he heard and we had both heard what we can only describe as monkey slash gorilla sounds you would hear on Discovery Channel or something. It was like, ooh, ooh, ah, 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 sound. It was far off, but deep and rumbling, unlike you would hear on TV. I want to say it was like directly focused at us. I only say that because the other people were sitting behind us, maybe only 10 feet away, and they didn't hear it, only us. Now we are freaking the hell out, and nobody is sleeping in their tents. We don't want to say anything and freak everyone else because, at this point, they are already all on edge. I have been hiking and camping here in the Pacific Northwest for almost 20 years now, and have never experienced this while camping out with my family and friends. I am 39 years old from East Coast and have been shot at and chased growing up in the ghetto. I am a former US Army infantryman who has spent countless nights in only a sleeping bag in a dugout sleeping hole and in tents. I am now afraid to ever sleep in a tent again after this weekend. I have never really ever felt fear like I did that first night in all my time in the forests out here, except when I was a kid in the woods back home. My name is Brandon, and I live in Alabama. I'm about 14, and this story takes place in the year 2008, or 2009. I'm not really sure, I was quite young. So at the time, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather, which I'm not going to say exactly why. So we were beginning to move, and we were doing things around the yard putting grass around the house. We had a few people helping my grandfather and grandmother while me and my brother played around in the street and around the house since it was not a very big house but big enough for us to have a deck on it and the back of it there is a small patch of woods just behind the house. So, me and my brother were just playing and I don't know, I just felt like something was off around the woods behind us, like something was there, keeping an eye on us, watching us. I would hear sounds of leaves and branches moving. Maybe it was the wind, maybe not. Maybe 40 or 50 minutes later, we were pretty hungry and thirsty, so we ate and later on went back to play. So when we got back, we went to play, and about ten minutes had passed. I totally forgot about the woods, and the sounds I had heard stopped. I stopped and just looked to see if I could see something. And I walked over there, not really close, but close enough, and still nothing. It's like whatever was in there just stopped, so I didn't want to think about it even more, because I got paranoid easily and left, and didn't go back over behind the house. The next day, there was only a little grass left to cover the house, and the sun was setting, and I didn't remember to avoid the back of the house unless necessary. I was playing, and walked behind and stood. I had a feeling in that something else was there with me. I turned to my right, and I saw this big animal or something, like a werewolf or some sort of upright dog with yellow eyes looking at me, laying on the ground. I stood there for a few seconds and then ran to the front of the house, telling my grandparents what I just saw. Well, neither of them didn't believe me and told me to keep playing, so for the rest of the time, I just sat at the front of the house thinking that's what it was. I still don't know what it was or if it was there at all, and before I moved there, I swear I heard things outside in the woods, and sometimes I've seen things. Things first started really taking off around 2010. See, 
my best friend lives on the outskirts of a small nearby community, which is only about 10 miles away as the crow flies. There's a lot of heavy brush and forestation. It's all primarily secluded private property. The nearest neighbor is roughly a quarter mile away in both directions. One night, my best friend's girlfriend had just left his house from spending the evening with him. They were having a picnic outside in his front yard together when he had thrown an apple out in his front yard. He had taken one bite out of it, tasted that it was too sour for him, and threw it. The next morning came, and he was outside his yard doing some cleaning up when he went to go find the apple that he accidentally left and noticed it was gone. He didn't put a lot of thought into it. He just thought an animal had gone and taken it. After all, it was just one apple. He threw it, figuring animals would come and eat it anyway, as he often let out food around for deer and other critters far away from his house to eat. It was about a week later when he came home from work to find a dead fox on his porch. It looked like it had been strangled to death. Its eyes were literally popping out of its skull. He said the kill was fresh and wasn't sure if somebody was just trying to mess with him or what. Then he looked next to the fox and the same now rotting apple with one bite taken out of it was sitting right next to the dead fox. He began freaking out and was plenty sure that somebody was screwing with his head. He didn't call anyone though. Instead, he waited and gauged to see if anything else would happen. Time went on and nothing else happened. These events that I just told you about happened in September before it started to get chilly. And so fast forward about six to nine months to the following spring, just as it was getting warm again. One evening, as he was having his girlfriend over for dinner at his house, his girlfriend started screaming that there was a huge hairy man in the front lawn. He flew out and opened his door. There, standing about 50 feet away in the front yard, was this big black mass, he, as he described it. It was just standing there. His eyes tried to focus in on it in the twilight of the evening, but his eyes pulled him to the object that this thing seemed to be holding in its hand. It looked to be a dead raccoon, a rather large one too. He couldn't make out a face, definitive features, or anything else that would be specific to its description but he said that he felt like it was staring right at him. This thing quickly darted behind a nearby tree once it realized he was looking at it. He said this creature seemed to be about five to six feet tall, if he had to guess, was really bulky and very shaggy and hairy. He knew instinctually that what he had saw outside of his house was a Sasquatch. Over the next couple of days, he thought more and more about it, and believed that this creature was the thing that had left the dead fox on his porch, along with the apple with one bite taken out of it the previous fall. He hasn't experienced any other activity around his house, or anything like that, since initially sighting this in his front yard. Hello. I have a few short experiences to tell you about. This all started when I was about 12 years old. I'm 19 now. My sister Zoe, father, stepmother at the time, and her two daughters, Jade, who was my age, and Maddie, who's my sister's age, were camping. We had really only been there for a day, and everything was fine. Then me and my sisters decided we were going to go to the stream by ourselves. My father gave us a walkie-talkie just so we can keep in contact while we were gone. Now the place we were going to was surrounded by bush and to get there you had to go down a little path through it. 
We spent a while with our shoes off and splashing in the water, when Jade said she could see something standing amongst the trees. We all looked and saw a figure. It was black, but you could tell it was the shape of a man. You couldn't see the face. We stared for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. We forgot about it and kept playing in the water, but I felt a little uneasy. A while later, we all looked back wanting to know if he was still there, and he was. Everything was silent. I could hardly hear the rapids in the little stream. We stopped looking. After about 20 minutes, we headed back to the campsite. The forest and all the noise around us was dead silent. My sisters lingered behind and I was about 20 meters ahead of them. But we couldn't see each other. I heard a twig snap behind me and I turned to look, assuming that they had caught up to me. No. I turned to see the tall, dark, black figure literally a foot behind me. So I started running. The whole time I could feel it close behind me. I ran as fast as I could until I was out in the open campground. It was gone. My sisters came out not long after I, and I told them what had happened. I asked, but none of them had seen it behind me, and they were too far behind anyway. The path was windy, so they were around a corner from me most of the time. Throughout our camping trip, we didn't see it around as much, but occasionally, we would just see this figure just standing there, watching us. Fast forward a couple years, and we go back there, with my father's new girlfriend and her daughter, Stella. I can't quite recall this trip as much, but I know for a fact that Stella saw it too. Bigfoot encounters. They come in all shapes and sizes. But tonight's special episode features what's known to many residents in the area of Michigan as the Lake Dewey Monster, strongly believed to just be another Bigfoot, or maybe perhaps something more nefarious. This episode features 12 encounters from this area detailing the beast that lurks in the wilderness and the swamps there. There are a few instances of stories claiming to have sketches and pictures. If you would like to look at this yourself, you can simply go to Google and look for the Lake Dewey Monster sketches, as well as the Lake Picture pictures, as stated in the very last story, to get you a better idea of what these people saw. Now, on to the stories. Story 1 On Friday night in late August, several people called into the sheriff's office claiming they had heard a large explosion. One call came in from the Five Mile Corner Store gas station. The other was from a payphone near the same area. The police were dispatched to the area after a brief search located a small glowing fire and billowing smoke. They followed it to an isolated area on Priest Street where they found an overturned car on fire. The car was entirely engulfed in flames and approach was made for rescue but no one was seen inside. The fire eventually put out, though the car was burned to the bone. The area was cordoned off while the deputies investigated. Eventually, the car was identified to belonging to a man from South Bend, Indiana, who told the police that his brother had borrowed it. Shortly afterward, the police were notified by a local Midred Whittingmore. The two teenagers were in her house after being in an accident. Police interviewed the couple, Roy Townsend, and Jay Arndt, both from Hillsdale, who were both in shock. They eventually indicated that they had been sitting in their car for some private time when something attacked it. They indicated the auto was pushed forward and then flipped over. They crawled out as something began smashing the vehicle. Mr. Townsend stated that at first they had been hit by another car, but couldn't understand when it appeared to be a thing. Townsend claimed that it was like a bear, but looked like a giant man and began smashing the car. Miss Arndt indicated that Townsend initially took off running and left her there, 
but then found later as she ran along the road back toward the highway. She indicated that she was still very angry with him, but even more scared that this thing would catch up to them. They stumbled up to the random house of Whitney Moore, who was very accommodating. At first, the police were skeptical and believed the teenagers were attempting to cover for wrecking the car. However, one of the multi-jurisdictional officers, Gourley Jones, at the scene noticed the tire drag mark ended at a point just over the lip of the hill. Upon further inspection, Officer Jones documented several important things. First, the skid marks continued over the hill, which indicated that the car's wheels were locked and the car was moving at a constantly slow rate of speed as it continued over the small knoll. Secondly, the tread marks were clear and articulated at the pivot point where the car flipped, indicating it had been lifted as opposed to suddenly going airborne. And third, if the car had flipped over as a result of losing control at high rate of speed, it would have gone airborne at the peak of the hill rather than after descent down the slight incline. At the time, the other officers ridiculed Jones. Additionally, his immediate supervisor rendered his observation as irrelevant and that it would lend no particular change in the outcome of things. Towns said and Arndt did not sustain any remarkable physical injuries, but their parting was not amicable. Officer Jones indicated that the next day, in the light of the sun, he searched the area, and he indicated in his report that the brush and grass going to the woods and lake had been obviously disturbed by something. He also indicated he found no footprints, but added that soil is dense with crabgrass or stone to the waterline. An elephant would not leave footprints there. Story 2 On a late September evening in 1962, four friends from Chicago were returning to the Twin Lakes cottage their parents had rented for the month. They were coming back from Grand Haven where they had supposedly gone to see the open of a musical fountain. After approximately a two-hour drive, they found themselves some 15 minutes away from Twin Lakes as traveling along the unpaved gravel road of Dewey Lake Street. As they slowed down through a narrow stretch of gravel road that navigated between the swamp on the eastern stretch of Dewey Lake Road, their headlights suddenly fell on what Randy Imes claimed looked like a giant tree growing in the middle of the road. Imes indicated that Terry Jones stopped the car, considering what to do at which point the tree turned around and looked at them. Jones recalled the animal towered over them standing in the road. Then, it just casually walked over and into the swamp on the north side of Dewey Lake Road and disappeared. The girls were screaming so loud and they did not stop until we got almost back to the cottage, Jones remembered. I was worried about getting past that thing, so I didn't stop, but I do remember seeing that it just walked into the swamp and into the dark. Randy Imes remembers, I really wanted to go back the next day in the daylight, but I have to admit, I was scared to be caught up on that road again if it did show up. Years later, I did go back when we were up there on vacation. The road was paved by then, but it did not make any difference. That place was scary, even in broad daylight. Story 3 On a Sunday night in late September of 1962, five children were playing in Glenwood, Michigan. They had finished watching their favorite television shows and gathered together searching for a fabled Luna Moth. Around 9 p.m., they were about to break up and go home in preparation for school the next day, when Jamie Shaw took off across Dewey Lake Street in pursuit of what he thought were fireflies. His friend Mark Miller reportedly shouted to him, Those are no fireflies at this time of the year. Nevertheless, Jamie pursued the embers in the distance into the swamp. The remaining friends continued to play for a while. Eventually, Katie Keene's mother began calling to her. It was time to go home. It was then they realized Jamie had never returned. She remembered, I asked, where's Jamie? But no one knew where Jamie was. He never came back from his firefly hunt. At first, no one panicked, but then after calling and searching without finding him, we told Mrs. Howie and Mrs. Shaw, Katie stated, Soon afterward, the small neighborhood came out and began searching the area with flashlights. Just as Harry Woods, a local, was about to call the police, they found Jamie. He was curled up in a weeded area beside the swamp crying. Katie Keene remembered, We were scared. 
We did not know what happened. We thought he had been attacked by someone or was dying or something. Jamie later told a story to his parents. He said he had been attacked by a huge hairy man who smacked him to the ground and threw him across the street. Jamie Shaw did not go to school for three days. When he did, he told his classmates the story of the attack. The school principal later contacted Jamie's father regarding the injuries to his back. Mr. Shaw confirmed to the principal that the scratches on his back were caused from the incident of the previous Sunday night. The same story Jamie had relayed to them. Jamie's teacher, Miss Salee, did say at first she did not believe him. However, after a recess conversation with Jamie was convinced he was, in fact, attacked by something that threw him around. Saley stated, I am amazed he was not killed. His bruises were horrendous. Story 4 On Wednesday evening, October 31, 1962, Betty Garkin was taking the evening train from Detroit, Michigan, back to her home in Chicago, Illinois. The train had already gotten a late start, and as the train approached the Dowagayak, it slowed to a stop at the remote Dewey Lake Street crossing in Glenwood, Michigan. The train remained there for approximately 15 minutes to investigate debris on the tracks. While looking out the window, northwest, into the darkness, Miss Garkon reportedly witnessed what appeared to be a faceless tree or giant stump stepping forward from the thick surrounding woods, approaching the tracks. The figure then simply leered at the train motionless for several minutes. Miss Garcon summoned the attention of two other passengers, Emily Clark from Chicago and Roger Wentworth from St. Louis, who confirmed the sighting. After a moment, the figure began moving from the tree line toward the caboose of the train, which sat in the darkness on the rural tracks. The consensus was that the figure was about 10 feet tall and weighing between 700 to 1,000 pounds. The Hulk then disappeared into the darkness toward the rear of the train. A porter was called. However, at that point, the train once again began moving. A loud metal impact was heard toward the rear of the train and presumed to be the result of a cold start on the rural tracks. The train continued until its eventual stop in Chicago without no further incident. However, after arrival at Union Station, Chicago, departing passengers were drawn to a considerable dent in the end car of the train. Miss Garcon reported what she had seen, along with the two other witnesses to the Chicago PD. The rendering of her description as detailed to the CPD sketch artist has become known as the Garcon train sighting sketch and is widely considered to be the best conception of the monster. The sketch provided as contingency while immediacy of a potential emergency was evaluated. After the initial statements were taken, sketch completed and situation considered, it was dismissed and referred outside the department. The 1960s were an extremely turbulent time in Chicago, and Miss Garcon reported that the CPD did not take her too seriously. She stated that they informed her that she would need to file a report with the respective city and county or state, as the incident took place outside of their jurisdiction and would not warrant federal involvement. They informed her that they were overwhelmed with real crimes and did not have time to pursue a joint venture monster sighting in Michigan. The case was never further investigated. Story 5 Fitch Camp was a fun year-end activity for the students of Dawagayak school system. The students would get a break from traditional classes to partake in a more outdoor environment. The parents and students alike enjoyed the Fitch Camp experience as it was a fun way for the kids to participate together in the unique Southwest Michigan geography. Situated amongst the sister lakes, the children were able to engage in a serene environment. After some outdoor races, a group of the kids went to the makeshift archery range. After the exercise, the students were to go directly to the diner at the mess hall. However, two of the girls, Denise McCormick and Janine Fisher, went to retrieve an arrow, which had gone awry. Approximately one half hour later, Denise and Janine showed up late to dinner and sat with their friend Rhonda Burdick and Stacy Ashley. It was at that dinner, Denise and Janine confessed to their friends that, while looking for the arrow, they saw a huge, stinky, hairy man staring at them. They told their friends it was really big and just stared at them, so they ran. 
The story got around, and by the time they went to bed that night, everybody was laughing at them. That is until the cabin in which these same girls were staying was attacked. Stacy Ashley stated that, Something began smashing the side of the cabin. I thought it was going to smash the wall in. Rhonda Burdick added, We were all screaming and Janine was thrown out of bed. The camp counselor was not present and later thought to be the one smashing the side of the cabin, attempting to frighten the girls. But the next morning, after washing away what she thought was fake footprints from the mud leading up to the side of the cabin, Susan Howell remarked that she was shocked to notice the side of the cabin had cracks along the foundation. I immediately wished I had not washed away the footprints. She took Polaroid pictures of the cabin, but was told by another camp director that it did not prove anything. However, some 50 years later, all the girls involved in the incident still stand by the sighting and attack. Story 6 Errol and Sally Cunningham had been married for 32 years. They owned a cottage on Cable Lake and Sister Lakes in Dowagayak, Michigan. They enjoyed their cottage, but in the late 50s development had accelerated in the area. The couple enjoyed the development as it seemed to progress well with the natural beauty of the lake area. On an early Friday evening in mid-July, they had driven up to their cottage and settled in for a week-long stay. Miss Cunningham had walked out to the backyard overlooking the lake and took in the early evening. She then saw something on the far shore of Cable Lake. Her husband came out and stood beside her. They reportedly noticed an animal on the far shore. Errol Cunningham remarked, Look at that. Sally Cunningham stared at the thing with her husband. We were transfixed, mesmerized. We did not know what it was. It was a wild life, but we could not really make out what it was for the distance in the weeds. Sally Cunningham stated, Then it stood up. She recalled the thing stared as though it were looking at us. She continued, I don't know what it was. I don't know what was more frightening, seeing that giant animal stand like a man, or the fact that the thing seemed to be looking at us. Errol Cunningham told the Chicago Sun-Times that, I think we were only curious until it took a step into the lake toward us. Then it was walking into the lake toward us. I got scared and took Sally inside. Mr. Cunningham recalled that inside the house, they began to discuss what they had seen and what they should do about it. Errol told his wife he did not want to call the sheriff over something they thought had been seen and decided to attribute it to the local teenagers playing a prank. Sally and Errol then went to have drinks on their rear porch to relax, but it turned horribly bad when, instead of watching a sunset, they noticed bubbles trailing toward their beach below. It was at this point Errol and Sally went back inside to call the police and to report an oddity. Sally and Errol were consumed in choosing their words to the police as to not seem paranoid. However, as the sun began to set on the lake, Errol recalled, Sally gasped. I knew something was terribly wrong. She was looking out the beach window. I dropped the phone and ran over and saw it. A large, long-armed thing standing on our beach. It was glistening wet and just staring up at our house. Years later, Sally Cunningham stated, We ran for the car. Errol backed out and that thing was already standing behind us. Errol drove away, but something was wrong with the car. There was a large bang and scrape, but we kept driving. Sally later claimed that, back in Lockport, we stopped to discover the bumper was entirely missing. That thing was some kind of supernatural being. They sold their cottage and never returned after. Initially, neighbors called in to report loud noises, but in follow-up to the Cunninghams refused to discuss the matter. It was only in 1972, after the Cunninghams retired to Florida, did they confess the nature of their departure from southwest Michigan to a former neighbor who still maintained a property there. This was then confirmed by Sheldon Stein doing research on a vacation home circular for Chicago residents. Story 7. R.J. Lutz drew this picture for his friend Harold Underhill. This is a picture of the animal that Lutz encountered when fishing on a very early morning on June 22, 1963, on the south end of Dewey Lake. Lutz was fishing for perch in the pre-dawn darkness when he noticed a large, triangular-shaped bobbing on the surface of the remote portion of the lake. 
He slid up closer to it, believing it might be the head of a large snapping turtle. However, as the sunrise illuminated the water, he caught sight of a large log extending from the triangle. He slid up closer to it and became curious when he noticed the log to be a shaggy red. Lutz remarked he had no idea how a cedar tree got in the water and extended his oar to roll the log over. When coming into contact with the log, the thing stood up in the water, revealing a large animal. The animal, which was approximately 10 feet tall, let out an increasingly loud clucking sound, which became so loud it was painful, Lutz recalled. He said the animal then glared at him and then slid back underwater and swam off like a crocodile. Lutz had no idea what the animal was, only that it might be something that was far from home and just didn't belong in Dewey Lake. His friend Harold Underhill recalled laughing at Lutz and accusing him of being a drunk. However, Lutz sketched out the picture for Underhill and maintained the story's validity until he passed away in the early 80s. Story 8 On a hot, muggy evening in late July of 1963, Alan Razek and Bob Ford carried their canoe through the weeds and mud to the water's edge. I thought we are going to get stuck in mud with the canoe on our head. We heard it was a mess there, but we did not realize. Thick, black, deep mud, Bob Form claimed, but we were told it would be worth it because it was not fished out. Muddy, tired and covered with sticky weeds, they slid the canoe into the water onto the black water. That lake you could not see anything below the water, Alan Razek told the Cass County Sheriff's Office. A mist had settled over the lake and we expected the fishing to be quite extravagant. It was thick fog like an old horror movie. Even the flashlight would choke out, Ford recalled. We had been on the water for only a few moments when the water splashed, so we sat. We couldn't see a damn thing. Then the boat started rocking. Then again a splash. Bigger. Louder. Then we heard a sucking sound, and then a loud roar like an angry animal, Rasik stated. We sat there quiet, trying to figure out what the hell was going on or what to do. And then we heard something breathing like a bowl. Moore confirmed and added, we could see something over by the sound and I can make out a large black shape. We started paddling like hell. Moore and Razek reportedly pulled the canoe out, running back through the weeds, making it back to Moore's truck. They loaded the canoe in a rush, failing to secure it properly. Less than a mile away, the duo had to pull over and clean up the canoe, which had come loose and smashed in the road. Jim Casey had come up on them and on his way home and stated, It was weird because I just saw this mess in the road. Then I talked to them and it was a weird thing. A couple of tough old birds talking about this thing in Mud Lake, Casey said. It did make me think twice every time I drove my Mud Lake. Years later, Razik confessed to his daughter that the incident on Mud Lake had been the strangest thing that ever happened to him and told her to stay away from those lakes. Something lives in them. Story 9 It was only one short month after the canoe was destroyed on a road in Twin Lakes and a monster was reported on Mud Lake when another canoe was found destroyed. This one on the bottom of shallow water on the south side of Pitcher Lake. But this time, its owner went missing. Stan Red Roberts was staying with his friends Philip and his son Roger McPhee. The McPhees had driven down from Lansing, while Red was in town from California. Red had long-standing financial problems, and Philip McPhee later told police he was leery of having Red stay with them, as he said Red always asked to borrow money. After joining them in the rental on the lake, Red and Philip had a few beers. Then, Red decided to take the canoe out on the lake. Philip declined as he planned to turn in early to take his boy fishing at sunrise. Philip went to bed. In the morning, Philip and Roger got in a rowboat and put in. Philip did not see Red or the canoe and thought maybe he had fallen asleep on the lake. I knew they didn't have a motorboat on Pitcher Lake, so I wasn't worried. It's not like a lot can happen out there, Philip had told the police. The fish were not biting, nothing. Not one single bite, Philip recalled. I never saw the lake like that. I got so frustrated about the lack of fish, I just sort of forgot about the whole red thing. It was only after returning and not seeing the canoe or red, Philip had become concerned. 
I have to admit, at first I was afraid Red had stolen some stuff and taken off. But by early afternoon, Philip had become concerned and took his rowboat back out to attempt to find Red. I thought maybe he was over on the other side, bothering some neighbors or something. But Philip recalled he did not even get 100 yards from the shore before he saw the canoe. It was sitting on the bottom of the lake, in the clear shore water at the edge of the lily pads. At first, I was pissed, because I saw a giant hole in the canoe sitting on the bottom, and I thought he probably started drinking with some people he met, and they got crazy. Philip called the sheriff, and a deputy was sent out. They pulled the canoe out. Red, however, was never found. Philip had to pay for the broken canoe. A nearby vacationer helped with the retrieval and then spent the rest of the afternoon looking through the area. Turns out he was a retired Chicago PD detective by the name of Paul Wozniak. He later showed Philip the pieces of the canoe scattered amongst the dense weeds, mud, and trees. It was hard to get to because the water got thin and the weeds got very thick. Not hard enough to walk on and not wet enough to paddle through. An excerpted portion of a letter Wozniak wrote to the Herald Palladium on August 27, 1963, stated the following. The pieces retrieved told me that the hole was created by a singular force blasting up from the bottom, especially as there were not broken pieces directly underneath the canoe, and no pieces caught in the canoe itself, so there is no other way to explain what happened. Philip never heard from Red again. Story 10 Leon Brosnan and Danny Peterson loved to fish. They heard there was great fishing on Gear Lake. But unfortunately, there was not a public place to put in. Nevertheless, they were able to get permission to path the boat on early Wednesday after school. Leon and Danny were eager to use their new head-on lures. I remember Leon was laughing at me for using a steel leader on my lure, but I told him I did not want to lose it, and he said that's only for sharks, Danny stated. Leon Brosnan stated that they were using a heavy test line, way too heavy for inland lake fishing, but we always had a fantasy about landing a 25 pound bass, so it was a fun thought. I had no idea it would actually be too light. I still can't believe what happened. I can't believe what I saw. And what Leon saw was this. Danny had tossed his line with the steel leader toward the north edge of the quiet lake. The red and white bobber sat unflinching on the still water. I remember we were kind of getting disappointed. We had worked so hard to get on the lake, and we were getting no bites from anything. No bluegill, no perch, nothing, Danny remembered. We had brought bologna sandwiches with Cokes. I turned around to get the food and was talking to Danny. Then I saw Danny's face change. My pole jerked and then settled back. Leon went crazy. He just kept saying, holy crap, over and over. His eyes were huge. As it turned out, Danny reeled his line in to discover the steel leader had been bitten through. Leon held up the end of the paddle and told me he saw the mouth come over the bobber about this big. A mouth as big as the boat paddle had bitten through the line and jerked the canoe before breaking the line. It was a giant mouth that came over the top of the bobber. It was covered in hair and I swear I saw eyes just before it went back under. Leon confessed later to a DNR representative. Then the DNR guy told us later it was probably a garfish. Leon stated, I have been fishing my whole life. I have seen garfish. That was no garfish. Danny Peterson later stated, I wish I had been one to see it, but I just could not get over how it bit through that leader. It must have had razor teeth or vice jaws. Story 11 Elmer Polinick had worked for the National Motors Auto Specialties for well over 20 years before he retired in 1963. He increasingly spent more time in the woods around his house off Griffiths Road in Cassipolis. So, it was of no surprise when neighbors saw him walking through the woods with his green backpack on in the Newton Woods. But it was shocking a short time later when Elmer stopped people from walking toward the Dawagaya Creek. He told the Smith family they needed to call the sheriff. The sheriff was called and deputies showed up and to investigate the reported body found. After investigating the reported discovery, police removed the bones indicating it was multiple carcasses of deer. However, 
Elmer Polinek told the police and the witnesses who had gathered that he walked upon a large, red-haired animal weighing as much as a truck, departing the pile of carry-on. Elmer said the animal barked at him and then entered the creek walking west. Helen Smith, who spoke with Elmer, stated that she believed what he told them. You cannot fake that kind of reaction. Elmer was a tough guy when he came up the path. He was shaking and sweating. The deputies at the scene reportedly told the witness that the deer carcass would be removed and the woods was open. Nevertheless, the family speaking with Elmer left. Story 12 Davis Garrett had been given a new Nikon camera for his 18th birthday. Photography was his hobby. He had his own in-home darkroom. He was the photographer for all school events and the yearbook. On Halloween, Davis and his three friends went to a party at Picture Lake. As the sun began to set, Garrett and his friend Dominic Emery saw a commotion on the west side of the lake. Garrett began to snap pictures. They then saw a large animal throw a log halfway toward them. Garrett and Emery turned and ran back to their gathering. As they made their way back, the thing let out a scream so loud, Emery said it hurt my ears. When they arrived back at the gathering, everyone was quiet because they had heard the noise, Emery said. A bunch of us took flashlights and went over there, but then got terrified. Party's over, Garrett stated. When Garrett developed the pictures, it appears to show a large ape-like creature scaled to about 10 feet tall, strolling the swampy waterline. It has since become known as the Pitcher Lake Picture. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my content, be sure to leave a like, comment, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'm going to be starting to release a lot of content daily, so start to keep your eye out for all sorts of cool stuff coming down the pipeline, such as more Dogman encounters, Mothman, Chupacabra, UFOs, Gargoyles, Swamp Monsters, Camping and the Middle of Nowhere stories, Paranormal, Black Eyed Children, and so, so much more. Get ready, because this summer is going to terrify you. I am an avid hunter. My name is Bo, and I have hunted and fished all my life. I joined the army straight out of high school, and now I work six days a week. But enough about me. Y'all want to know what true nightmares are made out of. I have found out last October, hunting in New River, I had gotten up early that morning and cooked breakfast for my fiancé. My fiancé loves fried eggs in the morning, and I do them exactly like she likes. So we eat, and I get my camo out of the bag, as well as my rifle, out of the cabinet. We headed out that morning, and I took my fiancé to work. Her work was on the way to New River. When we pull in, I give her a kiss, and she tells me to bring her home something good. I told her I would and I got back in my jacked up Chevy 2500. The trip to the mountain was as gorgeous as always, and the Tennessee back roads are amazing and beautiful. So I got to my stand, but it was so eerily quiet that morning. Around noon, I decided to go to the truck and grab a sandwich and another bottle of water. So I eat a peanut butter and syrup sandwich my fiance made me while I was getting ready. She even had time to write me a note, and basically said she loved me, and was happy that we were together, since it was only one month out from having our little girl, and she was just an amazing old lady. After I got done, I decided to walk to the tree stand again. On my walk back, in the woods, I start to have this feeling of dread, that something is wrong, that something just isn't right. But I brush it off thinking maybe it's just nerves since this is hog country after all, and I have been chased on the road before that I'm walking on. But this just kept getting worse and worse. I started getting deeper down the ridge, closer to my stand, and I hear a twig break, and I stop. Now, me being an experienced hunter, I notice movement in this thicket just about 50 or so yards away. I noticed this brown shape moving out towards me. So I crouched down, 
ready my rifle, and I train my rifle on the color, when I get to noticing that this thing is grunting. So I'm thinking, yes, a big buck, God was I wrong. The thing slowly walked out closer and closer, and I realized that, wow, this creature's so massive, it's way bigger than a deer on all fours. So I'm thinking, okay, an elk is walking out. Cool. But I noticed its head and the shape is all wrong. It slowly starts walking out. All of a sudden, it stops and stands up. I mean, on two legs, it's easily eight feet tall, but because I'm 6'6", the thicket is just above my head, and this thing's almost a foot to two feet above it. It, it starts sniffing the air, and its head snaps right to my direction. I freeze up at that moment, feeling like I'm concreted to the ground. The wolf thing that I was looking at was beginning to let out this real, deep, almost demonic-like growl. It starts snarling, showing its teeth towards me. I, being army trained, realize if it charges, I'm only getting one shot at this thing, so I'd have to make it count. All of a sudden, it begins to tear through the bushes on all fours again. I realize the movie Van Halen's Werewolf is charging at me at full speed. I realized I'm in big trouble, and I hear this branch break behind me. I look over my shoulder and see that there is a second larger wolf behind me on two legs. It is easily nine feet tall, built like a bodybuilder with jet black fur. It drops to all four and starts running full speed towards me, but this one was a lot closer. I spin around and see that this thing is too fast for me to unsafely shoot at with my rifle. I jump out of the way of this monstrous beast charging me. I end up hitting the hard rocks and slid into the red clay mud, just to realize it already crossed the roadbed I'd been walking on, and the two wolves are set on a collision course. When the bigger black wolf hits the lighter brown wolf, he tackles the brown wolf to the ground. As they are rolling down the hill and clawing and biting and slamming each other into the hard ground, the smaller brown wolf kicks and paws from the bottom when its back claws rip the big black wolf's stomach wide open and throws him off onto the ground. The brown wolf then turns to me. It snarls and starts charging again at full speed. I am awestruck by the power of the wolf and the sheer size of it as it's on its way towards me. But the big black wolf slams the brown one from behind, running its arm through the brown one's side picking it up and clamps its massive jaws on its shoulder as it throws the brown one down away from me. It lands and rolls about 10 yards and jumps up running away back through the brush. I let out the breath I didn't even realize I was holding in at that moment. I look at the now bloody and beaten ripped open black wolf which is standing with blood dripping off its back claws and glistening white teeth dripping with the blood of the brown wolf. And for some reason, it registers to me that I have to show that I am no threat to the king of the mountain. I lower the rifle down, away from me, and as I do this, this thing smirks at me, lets out an ear-shattering roar that turns into a howl. As it looks into my soul, I see the eyes of a beast, and I can understand that it was there to show it was the alpha and as long as I showed him respect, he will not be a threat. It turned to drop on all fours and ran away after the other. I instantly take off running. Luckily for me and the army, it allowed for me to stay in great shape. I take off up the ridge and make it to the truck. Soon as I get to the door, I realize there's blood all over the side of my truck. I hesitate to look, but I had to know. I flip the rifle safety off, ready to blast anything that jump up from the bed of the truck. I realize there is a big, dead doe laying in the bed of my truck that has had its neck broken. I jump in, start the truck, spin it around, 
throwing gravel and two roster tails. I am tearing ass out of the woods, and I fly all the way down the mountain through the back roads and don't stop till I reach Dinmer. My fiance can tell I'm shaken up, so she ends up taking me home. I tell her everything, but we decide to tell everyone that I hit the dough with my truck, and I got spooked by it, because who would believe me, right? That is, till I got to hearing other people who have seen this massive animal as well. So I thought that this would be the best way for me to get the story off my chest and not get told I'm crazy or lying or making it up. I just wanted to warn every hunter and hiker around that we ain't the top of the food chain or the king of the mountain because the king of the mountain is a truly massive beast who has no predators. Thanks again for helping me get this off my chest. Now, let me tell you about my second encounter. I have the Bigfoot encounter where me and my fiance had seen that same wolf man. We have been going hunting in New River again. We have seen a family of Bigfoot for three or four years now. They have never been aggressive or anything like that. They show respect and are generally curious creatures. There is four Bigfoot in the area. The big male is jet black and about nine to ten foot tall. He looks like a jacked hair man. The second largest is a female, about eight foot tall, a light brown color with black stripes down her shoulders and back. The two smaller ones are between six and eight foot tall, both lighter brown. There is one male and one female juvenile. The young male is a dark brown with a light brown patch on his chest. The young female is a light golden brown and absolutely gorgeous in color. We usually see them all together as a family unit, or the two males going out together. Looks as if hunting possibly because they have both been on the deer trails, or the gravel and dirt roads to cross the area. They are all very curious. They have been known to walk up close within 50 yards or so, whooping and chirping to me and my fiance. We have had a blast seeing them and getting them used to us being in the area. We have built a cabin down in the holler of the ridge. This cabin in the woods is set next to a gorgeous place set between creek branches, but in a way that we can get a vehicle to the door. We started first seeing the male, and I was nervous because it isn't too far where I'd seen the two dogmen fighting originally. Shortly after we got to seeing the full family, They'd check out the truck or look in the windows at night to see if we were cooking. There for a while, my fiance was scared of them, and then she realized that they were just curious. It has been amazing to see the young ones playing around in the creek on hot summer days. The big male lying in the cool mud, with the big female laid up in the shade while the two youngsters playing, splashing and rolling in mud, and even throwing mud. Once, the young male ran up behind me while I was fixing a tree stand that was sitting in the bed of my Chevy 2500. He scared me with the loud steps, running up behind me. Then, he let out a rather strange whoop, almost as if he said boo. As he said woo, I jumped around, startled, and the young one was standing there, laughing like a little fat feller who would be holding his stomach kind of like a backwoods Satan style laugh. I laughed at him and said, you little shit. The big male walked up and grunted towards him. He waved and ran away. My fiance had stepped out on the porch when she had heard the sound and waited to see them some more since it's been the second time that morning that they'd been around. She's seen me and the big male standing only 10 yards away from each other. He dwarfed me. I seen her face and it showed she was nervous, if not scared. It was a bit shocking to see him so up close, to have been close enough to smell his musky aroma. Last weekend, I noticed he got a new open wound on his chest. It was four big claws down his burly, leathery chest. We left some fruit that was going bad out for him, so he could get to it a bit easier, so he'd heal up because it showed me that he would protect the area. 
This weekend, we went up again, but didn't hear them or see them anywhere. I was honestly kind of worried that something happened to him and that the family would be in trouble. So I kept looking for them that Friday night, not seeing them all night long. The next morning, my fiance and I got up and had breakfast. We went hunting up the ridge just a ways and had a wonderful day together. We always have been side by side. Her love of hunting just made her so much more attractive to me. I honestly am the luckiest man in the world to have her as my partner. Saturday evening, we got back down to the camp, and we noticed something had been through the leaves all around the camp. It gave us a bit of hope that they're all okay. We had then gotten ready for supper, started cooking as the sun was setting. In New River, it gets pitch black dark in just a few moments. My fiancé had stepped out to the porch to go grab me a bottle of Jack out of the truck, and I heard the door open on the truck. I heard it slam as she came running through the door, and I drop everything, and I hurried to make sure that she's okay, and she was standing there saying that she thought our big male neighbor was coming up the creek bed towards us. So we decided to turn the camp stove down so we could step outside to watch him approach. So as we are standing there, I light a cigarette and hand it to my fiancé. As I light my own, I realized he is walking kind of weird and not sounding good. His normal strong crisp sounding grunts are sounding more deep and raspier. I take the bag of fruit out the back truck and we walk down closer to the creek bed. We creep back up the creek bank towards camp. As we are, the critter is coming closer to me, not knowing I stepped into a hole where one of the young ones had grabbed a clump of mud and thrown it. I hit the ground hard as I was stepping backwards, and I stood back up, quickly trying not to spook the Bigfoot with my pain groan. My fiancé turned and helped me back to my feet, but as she turned her back from the animal, my heart sank as I seen the deep pitch black wolf man that had won the fight before with the brown wolf. He starts picking up pace towards us, and in that moment I jumped to my feet. I told my fiancé to run, that I'd hold it off as long as I could. Its massive body jumps through the creek, still at an incredible speed, and so I put myself between the beast and I and my old lady, the love of my life. I couldn't let anything happen to her, so I am putting myself in front. Charging him, yelling this primal roar I never knew I had from the deepest place of my soul. The wolfman breaking out of the water on a full sprint towards me, as I have gotten his attention now. I draw a bowie knife out of this sheath my grandfather had left over from the Vietnam War. At this moment, knowing I'm going to die as he would destroy me, all of a sudden, there is a roar from the top of the hill. Standing proud, the young female was roaring and beating her chest as the wolf stops. So do I to see the new creature trying to enter the fray. My fiancé stops on a dime, and she was staring at me with tears in her eyes as I realized that she has the hunting rifle from the bed of the truck. The wolf starts to snarl and growl. He realizes he's in trouble, and he bats me away, onto my back. My fiancé takes a shot and shoots him. The shot goes into the chest, but it barely grazes him. As my fiancé comes running up to me and having another gun with her, handing it to me, we realize that the young female and young male standing across the creek had started throwing rocks at the wolfman. I start backing up slowly towards my fiancé as the big male bursts from the thicket and clears the creek in one jump and the massive male standing between us and the wolfman. He is roaring and beating his chest. The wolf then starts running again. The big male Bigfoot and the alpha wolfman hit into this devastating brawl. The wolf clawing and slashing the big male, proudly standing there. He grabbed the wolf by the throat and held him back as the two youngsters are pelting the wolfman with rocks. The male swinging its massive large arms down on the wolf and dropping it to its knees. But as that's going on, the wolf slashes the Bigfoot's legs 
dropping him to his knees. The Bigfoot and Wolfman, both being dropped to their knees, and as the Bigfoot hits its knees, it lets out a pained bellow. The Wolfman jumps on top of him. Then, one of the other Bigfoot swings a down tree and smashes the Wolfman right in the head. As it flips backwards, she swings, breaking the log across its stomach. He jumps and runs away, the female making a delicate chirping and clicking as she kneels down to the male. The young ones across the creek to reunite with the two larger family members. My fiancé is running to my side, wrapping me in a hug and holding me, saying thank God. The big male getting his bearings standing up from the ground and about ten yards away from me. He looks at me and does this light chirping and clicking toward me, cocking his head like a dog would, seeing if I was okay. The whole family standing there in front of us, while me, my fiancé, and the entire family of Bigfoot all let out this huge ringing roar together. It was kind of like a victory roar. Then they slowly make their way back up the hill to the top of the ridge where I believe their cave is located. Me and my fiancé head back to the cabin and get back inside. She checks me out, wraps up my ribs as we load the truck in record time. We leave out of there in the jacked 2500 Chevy. Fiancé holding my hand, saying that she's so proud of me and is just thankful that I'm okay. And we got to tearing down the mountain every bump, reminding me of my bruised ribs. I thanked her for coming back for me, and we get to the main road. She leans over, gives me a kiss, and we get the hell out of Dodge. Hey guys, What Lurks Beneath here. I hope you enjoyed this really cool Dogman vs. Bigfoot story. I know it might have been a little difficult to uh, listen through just because of how the story was sent in kind of shambles, so I had to slightly reformat it. But hopefully it's written in a way you can generally get the message across. Again guys, if you like my content, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment, and I'll see you all in the next video. When I was young, I was into anything unexplained, including Bigfoot, UFOs, Nessie, the Bermuda Triangle, etc. So I've always had an open mind about unexplained things. An odd connection to that interest was being raised in a Christian household. My father is a pastor and holds very deep and committed beliefs in what is written in the Bible. My brothers and I were taught from a very young age that things exist beyond our normal perception and that mainstream society would actively try to dismiss things such as miracles and healing or anything science could not explain. That belief also extended to spirits, demons, possession, and other things mentioned in the Old Testament. I mention this because the beliefs in anything Christian-based and cryptic are not often associated. However, even as a child, it made me open to the idea of things that mainstream society doesn't believe in can exist, and that it might be in modern science's best interest to dismiss the idea of such things since they cannot be explained by any current knowledge. The reason for this would be that modern science has be seen as having all the answers and cannot be questioned. I was also instilled with a distrust of authority as an entity and consensus as a barometer of truth and was encouraged to look for the truth myself. We were taught to keep an eye out for when lies might be more convenient than facts. That fostered a constant sense of existence of truth outside the textbook and in an awareness of suppression of thought, but also helped keep my mind open to all kinds of things 
spiritual, and otherwise. We did not, however, believe in Santa, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, or other cartoonish things. Even within our realm of belief, there were firm limits. Some may associate any belief in God as the same as belief in Santa. However, this seemed to foster in me an openness to the unknown without believing for the sake of novelty and focus towards what evidence does exist. People don't write books and have conferences about the existence of Santa as far as I know. By the time this happened to me, I was well open to the idea of UFOs and believed in the existence of Bigfoot. However, I never believed I would ever see one. In fact, I'm not even sure I wanted to at the time, or now. In my teenage years, I was busy with sports, music, and girls, and I had put my interest in the unknown in the back of my head. Until one weekend in 1995 or 96. I am recalling this as best as my memory serves. I lived in very rural southwest Colorado at the time, in a town small enough that I could walk out my back door with a fishing pole and a rifle, and hike around and nobody would say a word. I won't mention the name because the town is small enough someone could probably find out who I am just by knowing where that I lived there. The area itself has tons of deer and elk in town, and sometimes had issues with mountain lions that would move into town and take livestock and other small pets. A little further outside of town, we would see bears, and there are large areas of unoccupied forest nearby. I mention this to establish that, while I live and have lived in big cities for a good chunk of my life, I also have spent plenty of time in the rural areas and wilderness, hunting, fishing, and camping. I have an uncle that lives in Denver, and at the time, he and his then wife had bought a cabin outside of Fairplay which is where the old town of South Park City is. The area is called South Park, as a park is a flat area or valley of high elevation in a mountain range. In order to get there from Denver, you drive through places like Breckenridge, the ski resort town, to give you an idea of what the terrain was like. There are large swatches of national forest connecting around mountain peaks and areas where people either cannot access or rarely set foot. The cabins in the areas were really just modern houses built out in the woods with a bit of rustic but modern amenities. There were other houses within eyesight of his cabin and the town was not too far away, so the area was sparse but not completely isolated by any means. There were large fields of open ground, but the houses were built very close to thick forests that go up to the nearby mountains. One would simply have to cross a two-track dirt road and you would be in a forest where you could walk in a straight line for miles without seeing any sign of a human. This cabin had a large wood patio around the back and down one side, large glass windows in the living room facing the forest. The downstairs bathroom, the one we would primarily use, had semi-obscured glass blocks as a wall that faced the forest as well. There were motion sensor lights around the house and other modern amenities. The house was two-story with one of the upstairs rooms having windows that faced a thicket of pine and aspen trees that was actually about 10 to 15 feet high as the ground sloped away from the house on that side. I was 16 or 17 at the time and 
still in high school. Over the 4th of July weekend, my uncle invited some family and friends up to the cabin, just for a few days. We arrived right at dusk, a few days before the 4th. It was my mom and dad, my younger brother, two cousins, and two aunts and uncles, all sharing the house for the holiday. As soon as I got out of the car, I felt a massive uneasiness come down on me like a blanket. I honestly felt scared or in danger like I had suddenly stepped into a bad neighborhood. While I was trying to process this feeling and how out of place it was in the woods, I noticed my little brother seemed a bit jittery too, so I asked if he could feel that. He said he did. When I asked him what he thought it was, he whispered, Bigfoot, as if the word came out of him before the thought was actually in his head. Hearing him say what I was thinking made me shudder, and my hair raised on the back of my neck. We got the luggage in the house as fast as we could, with me looking over my shoulder at the tree line the whole time, but also trying to act normal. The adults were busy greeting each other and did not act like anything was wrong. However, I felt like I needed to at least reach the light of the porch as soon as possible, or something bad was going to happen. That night, everything was uneventful, with the parents talking late and us kids all in sleeping bags open on the living room floor. I'm pretty sure I fell asleep while the adults were still up, and being inside with them around felt safe. But I still felt very afraid about what might be outside the house. The next morning we got up, ate, and did the typical family gathering bathroom rotation. Some of the adults went on a hike. The weather was beautiful. The sky was clear and all the sense of unease was gone completely. The area was simply gorgeous. My brother and I talked a little bit about what we had said the night before, and I think we both felt a bit foolish about being so afraid. Since there was nothing else to do, we set up about exploring around the area with the loose goal of finding some kind of Bigfoot evidence. My cousin was primarily a big city kid, but when we told him what we were about, he was in too. In the back of my head, I had remembered some signs to look for, whether from a book or one of the few TV specials that were put out at the time. This was a time before anyone had talked about tree knocks or howling, so we stuck to looking for large animal signs. We found some odd things that morning. I spotted where leaves and bark were worn off the trees, about six to eight feet up. We found some small structures and oddly placed sticks and earth, and also some saplings that had been all twisted up. Probably the most significant thing we had found was a mature aspen on its side that had been completely uprooted in the middle of a grove of other unharmed trees. There were no signs of digging or other tools, and no rot of the tree itself. Even at my young age, I could conclude that it could not have been wind or some kind of mechanical force that would have caused this without there being any damage to the rest of the trees. Their shape was too tight to allow a backhoe or truck through without scraping up the other trees. That summer had been dry, so there were no footprints or other clear signs, however. There was certainly nothing I could show an adult without sounding a little nutty, so we kept our investigation to ourselves. Most of the things we found were relatively close to the house. I'm not sure the age of the neighborhood but I knew the houses hadn't been there very long, and the area was slowly being developed. But 
was still very close to large areas of uninhabited forest. Late that morning, I took a nap outside in a hammock. The breeze was perfect. There were wildflowers blooming. It was peaceful and quiet, with the exception of one of the neighboring cabin's dogs I could hear once in a while. We ate hot dogs, threw a football, and had a great, typical summer day. After a while, I forgot what I had felt the night before. That lasted until the early afternoon, just as the sun started to get close to the mountains on the horizon. Almost like a moving fog, the sense of unease and dread came back as strong as I felt the night before. I fought with myself a bit, trying to shake the feeling off, and telling myself I was being irrational and weak, but I couldn't rid myself of the feeling and did not feel relief until I was back in the house. I was flat out afraid of what was out there, and it felt like it was not only aware, but interested in us. We spent the rest of the afternoon playing music upstairs, as my cousin and I played guitar and bass together and had brought our instruments. We even wrote a goofy, childish song that I could still remember and can play to this day. The guitar riff isn't bad, but I've grown out of the lyrics comparing the past to dirty underwear. Haha. <laughs> Looking back, it's still strange the way things felt. Inside the house, we're surrounded by adults and light and laughter, so I would forget what I was feeling. Then I'd be alone for a minute or step outside to get something from the car and be reminded again immediately. I know I did a good job hiding it because, years later, when I told the people that were there what we saw, nobody had any idea we were afraid at all. That evening, we drove into town and rented a movie, Vertigo if I recall correctly, and ate dinner as a group. Some of the food prep was going on outside on the grill, but I don't know how to tell my dad or uncles that I was afraid for them and that they seemed to notice nothing at all. After dinner, some wine and beers were out along with dessert, and we put on a little concert for the adults, including the debut of our underwear song. Things were fine until the adults all trickled off into their rooms, and I was left with my brother and cousin in the living room, with its large windows and very thin curtains. I was having a hard time sleeping, though my brother and cousin didn't. My brother could fall asleep anywhere and sleep through anything. Sometime in the middle of the dead calm night, the motion sensor lights came on with a barely audible click. There was no sound, no wind, and even the neighbor's dog, which had been loud all day, was dead silent. After a few intense minutes, they turned off, then came on again, and again. I did not dare peek out the windows, but I could picture a giant hairy creature walking on two legs around the porch, trying to look in. With only a thin piece of glass and a white sheet of fabric separating us, I pretty much did not sleep that night. I was about six foot and 165 pounds, almost a full grown adult, yet here I was in a secure house with six adults under the same roof, but as scared as a baby, wishing one of them was in the room with me. The fear was almost paralyzing. I wouldn't even use the bathroom because I was worried I would see something through the decorative glass blocks that I could not unsee. The next morning was the fourth, and everything felt fine again, but I knew that would not last. We poked around outside some more, but I really did not want to stray too far from the house now. We saw a few more things, but nothing significant. The day was very cloudy and cold, with the heat and threat of a heavy thunderstorm that might hit any time. 
typical unpredictable summer mountain weather. That afternoon, some people showed up for a party, but rain came very heavy off and on and prevented any fireworks. However, there were strange things happening around the house. A few of the visitors brought their dogs and my uncle and his wife's two dogs, who happened to live harmoniously together for quite a long time, had a severe fight out of nowhere. My uncle had to hit his dog over the head with a shovel just to get her to go let go of the other dog. It was a sort of traumatic event that I never experienced since we didn't have dogs growing up. With people crying and yelling, I heard someone say there was dominance issues between the two dogs just due to the presence of another, but I felt there was another tension in the air they could sense that was causing them to act strange. They never once fought before. Around the time when the dogs had their altercation, the feeling returned so heavily I was about to crawl out of my skin. So I asked my brother and cousin if they wanted to go hang out inside the cabin. With the threat of the storm and the dogs fighting, everything felt off and tense, like something dark was pressing down on me. This time, it felt more acute, while before it had only been more of a vague sense. I felt like something was close by. We borrowed some binoculars and decided to go to the room upstairs just to see what we could see in the forest from the window. I felt a little more secure up high and out of reach. I tried to pinpoint a direction from where the feeling was coming from and focused the binoculars on that area in the trees. I was zoomed in moving the binoculars around and trying to focus on anything odd that I could see. I began to focus the lens on one aspen when I noticed I was seeing a dark shape behind it. All at once, my eyes and brain reconciled what I was focusing on. Matted fur with sticks and leaves stuck to it, the shape of a shoulder, and then it moved. I almost dropped the binoculars and my heart was beating out of my chest as I shuddered. I just saw a Bigfoot! I began shaking and had never felt so much fear in my life. My head was spinning, still trying to figure out what I knew I had seen. My brother and cousin both took a turn looking through the binoculars immediately after me as I wouldn't even put them back up to my eyes again. At first, they both acted like I was playing a prank, but both of them soon were as white as I was. My cousin said he was looking directly into a face with a skin texture similar to a gorilla. He said it was almost as if it, they made eye contact through the binoculars, and the eyes were empty and emotionless, and that made him more afraid. My brother said he saw a side profile as the creature had turned to look out into the clearing. He also described a gorilla-like profile, but he had no doubt what it was, and he also had no doubt he was interested in us. We actually shut the blinds and did not go downstairs for some time until we could act normal again. It still amazes me in the situation that I saw what I believed could have been proof of the existence of Bigfoot. It was within a hundred yards of the house, yet I didn't do anything to get concrete evidence. I could have told my uncle or dad or asked to borrow a camera because my uncle is a photographer, but the fear was just so overwhelming. I couldn't even think of looking at it again much less venturing into the woods after it. In the moment, processing the information almost makes it feel like your mind is splitting because your eyes are seeing something and communicating that something back to the brain. But the brain is telling the eyes to look again because that doesn't fit with what the brain knows should or should not exist. I partially think some of the fear was just fear of the unknown. 
I don't have any idea if the creature would have snatched one of us, or even done anything at all besides observe us, but I somehow knew it was aware that we knew it was there. We also knew that it knew it could destroy us if it chose to. We all left the cabin the next morning, and I remember feeling a great sense of relief leaving the area. It was years before I talked to any adults on the trip about what we saw. I told my dad about it late at night on another road trip across Colorado. He didn't say whether he believed me or not, but he said he felt there was so much wilderness in the US that it was conceivable to him that a North American ape could exist, yet elude mankind. My uncle, who I told years later, said he wished I'd told him so he could have started looking because he hiked and fished around there all the time. He said he felt he missed out on not being aware that something might have been in the area. They sold the cabin years ago, but in the last few years there have been many sightings in the area. There were prints casted about a mile or two from the cabin near a four mile creek on the back side of Pikes Peak. So sightings are frequent in the area, and we are not the only ones to have seen something nearby. Now that the internet has made it available for more people to communicate their personal stories, I feel much more confident telling my story. The behavior patterns seem to fit, with the creature being interested in the only kids at the house, and not seeming to pay any attention to the adults. I'm not sure why none of the adults could feel it, but I still get hairs on the back of my neck standing up just thinking about it. I never felt the fear that potent, yet I didn't necessarily feel threatened directly, just scared of something huge that was aware of me and could have kidnapped me if it wanted to. I also attributed the uneasiness that I didn't feel in the morning, but coming on into the afternoon to the sleep pattern of that particular Bigfoot, and it possibly watching us out of curiosity in the afternoon and even into the evening. I have been in the woods plenty of times since, but I am still haunted by what I saw and have to make a serious effort to not think about it when I am out, or else the fear can still paralyze me all these years later. Somehow, knowing it exists, yet so many people not believing it, generates even more fear. From a certain perspective, ignorance can be bliss. On the other hand, I like living in a world where mysteries still exist, and science is not as settled as they portray. <laughs>